Okay, so does everybody have a copy of this guy open? Yes, no, yes. sure. Okay, so we're going to go after the hair part first. So um, for me to do the hair part, again, I'm going to do a selection. I'm going to base it on trying to use the hair that I've already got in here. So I'm going to hit the L key to get the lasso tool. And you want to over-select this. So I'm going to select. I'm not going to select all of her hair. I don't worry about this part that's on the left-hand side. But I want to grab everything that's on the right-hand side. So I'm going to click and I'm going to drag kind of through her eye. Make sure that you get all the hair that's on the entire right-hand side. So I've just made this rough selection. It looks like this. And I'm going to copy this to its own layer. Command J. So I've got this in its own layer right now. Um, and what I need to do, again, this whole conversation that we've had about trying to cover the hair um, that actually then will give me a new hairline in the front, but then go all the way, the entirety of all the way to the edge of the image. The best way to do this is to transform the entire thing. So I'm going to hit Command T to bring up the transform dialog box. I'm going to grab the anchor point. That's the little point that sits right in the middle. Has everybody? Can everybody see their anchor point? Can anybody not see it? If you don't see the anchor point, look up at your options bar. There's a little check mark that you can put right next to this icon that's actually, this is the thing that shows or doesn't show your anchor point. So again, you need to be, Command T will get you into the transform dialog box, but also bring your options bar up to transform. You want to click that check mark to put the little anchor point in there. Then when I click on my anchor point, I'm going to drag it up to the top and anchor point is exactly what it says it is. It anchors this area of her, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this second layer up here to the top. Then I'm going to grab the lower right hand corner, I'm sorry, the lower left hand corner of my transform dialog box and I'm going to click and drag down. What I'm trying to do is reset the hairline along the bottom. I'm trying to bring it down. So for me, I'm trying to stretch this entire hunk of hair out so that it will then give me a new hairline and I can cover the area that I'm trying to cover. I don't know how far I need to bring this out, but that's okay. We can change this up as time goes on, so we don't need to worry about that. However, this is not a smart object, and I should have made this a smart object to begin with. So I'm going to hit the little circle with the slash through it to undo that transform. I'm going to then convert this thing to a smart object so that I can retransform multiple times without degrading the image. So up to the layer menu, down to smart objects, convert to smart object, and now hit command T to do the transform, drag the anchor point all the way up to the very top in the middle of it, grab the lower left hand corner and just pull it down. So again, I'm just trying to drag it down so that it covers that area. I'm going to go ahead and say okay to that by clicking on the check mark. And then I'm going to make, uh, again, I'm going to add this as a, a black layer mask on top of this. So with that second layer um, selected, the top layer selected, hold on your option key and click on the add layer mask. It puts on a black layer mask so it's completely hidden. Uh, and then I'm going to paint in the area that I want to fix. So I'm going to move, zoom in here, hit the B key to get a brush. In this case, I'm going to keep it as a medium hardness brush, normal blending mode, 100% opacity, 100% flow. White needs to be your foreground color so that you can be painting on this black mask to reveal this area. And I'm simply going to work my way over for the new hairline that I want. And then I'm going to completely work all the way out from this hairline. So again, the hairline, it's not set up uh, totally correctly uh, uh, for, the, for the, um, uh, the hairline that's underneath it, but it gives it to me about where I want this to be. And then I'm going to break the link between the chain, between the, the chain link between the pixel content and the uh, uh, mask content. I'm going to select the pixel content. I've got the white borders around it. I'm going to hit the V key to get the move tool. And now I can actually move this so that my hairline, my new hairline, actually runs along my mask. So I'm just bringing the two sort of together in here. Uh, and that actually looks pretty good to me right now. Uh, so I'm going to, I want to make sure, I want to take a look at my mask to make sure that there's no holes in the mask either. Hold down your option key and click on the layer mask and you can see I've got two holes that are sitting right here that I need to fix. 
So back to the B key for a brush. White is still my foreground color. So I'm gonna get rid of both of those. And then I've just abandoned the whole side of it over here. I'm not sure that I really wanna do that uh, total abandonment on the side over here. So I'm gonna turn everybody else back on so I can see everybody else. So I'm um, clicking again on my layer mask right here. And I'm going to simply turn this thing on and off and see, and you can see I've got a weird line that's happening right here. So I need to continue this layer mask all the way down to get the rest of the hair. So working on my layer mask with white as my foreground color, I'm simply going to continue to paint out everything else from this new hairline all the way down. And again, I'm gonna hold down my Option key, click on the layer mask, and fill in all the parts that I'm missing. And this is now my fix. And if I don't like what's going on right here, this part that's right in here, if I feel like this is encro encroaching too much, it's getting like too close to her eye, there's no reason that I can't continue to do the transform. The mask is in the proper place. It's just work that I need to do on the pixel content. So I'm selecting the pixel content again, Command T again to bring up the transform dialog box. At this stage of the game though, I don't want to do make it larger, smaller, move it around. I want to warp it. So I'm going to click on the icon on the very top in my options palette, the one that's it's a small weird little icon that's just to the left of the circle with the slash through it. If you click on that, you get a grid on your, uh, uh, on your, uh, um, your uh, pixel layer content. And this way you can actually come in and click and move parts of this around so that it actually lines up or feels better in that whole line where this is actually going. Um, and that seems to be working a little bit better for me. And I'm going to go ahead and say OK to this. And so then this is now my fix. To do the teeth, again, there's a million ways of doing these teeth. Um, some people, so I'll just run across a few of them. When we did the uh, teeth, when this assignment happened, we had not gone over Liquify yet. So Liquify is a way a lot of people will deal with this. What they'll do is they'll use Liquify to straighten out the jagged nature of the bottom of her teeth to make them more square and flat and that kind of stuff. Then again, a lot of this is about shadow work. You need to make sure that this front tooth is actually way too light for the back tooth. That's what's indicating that they're actually crossed over one another. So all of those things are going on in here. However, there's a, the way that I would fix this is actually simply replace the teeth. There's too much that's going on in here. So to replace the teeth, if you go out and take a look at your uh, uh, assignment folder for this, there was a folder inside there that was called New Mouths. If you take a look at your New Mouths, you can come through. I'm going to just uh, click on the very top one, hit my space bar. This shows me what the top one is. And I'm just going to go through looking for this. So this was not only trying to find a new mouth for this image. This is, I collect these things. I'll collect eyes. I'll collect mouse. I'll collect skin. Um, all of these things that I can ultimately use in other photographs. So I'm going to keep going down here. This would be, I think, a good candidate for it, but this is not the one I'm going to use. This a little too hyper. This doesn't show enough teeth. Again, so keep going through this to find the ones that ultimately you think will work. And this is the one that a lot of people used, and I think it's actually the one that's the most successful. So this is the one that I'm going to use. It's actually, if you want to use the same one, it's called Mouth 8 Copy. There's another mouth, just regular uh, Mouth 8 in here. This is not the one to use. It's the one above it. So if you want to use the same one that I'm going to use, it's this Mouth 8 Copy. So I'm going to simply drag that onto Photoshop. And if you get this mismatch thing, just say use the embedded profile instead of the working space. The minute we copy it over, it will actually um, uh, give us that, another offer to change uh, um, the uh, color profile of this particular image. I'm going to hide everybody else again. And then again, what I'm trying to do is get this mouth onto this face right here. So with the mouth uh, um, being the upper layer and showing, I'm going to grab the layer, drag it on top of the uh, other image, hold down the shift key and let go. 
you will get this other mismatch here and usually you want to pick the very first of these options and that is to do a conversion from the working space which is srgb or the generic one of this jpeg to the working space adobe rgb so i'm going to go ahead and say okay to that so i'm going to double click i'm going to go back and get rid of this mouth just the lone copy of it because i've now got it all in the same image where i need it double click on the hand and then we need to actually make this mouth fit this other uh, uh, uh the opening in her mouth right here so with that happening i'm going to reduce the opacity of the new mouth by like 50 percent hit command t to bring up the transform dialog box click on the link between the width and the height and then i'm simply going to make it smaller and move it down onto this image and then zoom in and so what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to get the mouth smaller the teeth smaller so that the mouth opening sort of fits and that actually didn't work for me the other thing so i just hit command z to undo that because somehow i hit an enter key to make this happen again this is another one of those things that i want to be able to do transforming repeatedly on this so i really should have made my first move should have been to make this a smart object however you don't want to make this a smart object with a 60 percent opacity because that will actually get baked into your smart object so i'm going to drag my opacity back up to 100 percent then up to the layer menu down to smart objects convert to smart object and then drop it down to 60 percent or 50 percent so that we can now resize it command t to bring up the transform dialog box click on the link between width and height i'm going to use the scrubby slider simply to ooh, what is going on here Command T to bring up the transform dialog box. Click on the link between width and height. Use the scrubby slider to drop this down. Click and move this into place. You can sort of rotate it slightly. Again, make it a little bit smaller. Rotate it back a little bit again. I'm not too concerned about making this perfect. I just need to get close here as far as this part goes. Because again, I can transform this after the fact. So I'm going to go ahead and say okay to this. I'm going to turn this temporarily up back up to 100 percent i'm going to turn it off so that i can hide it and then i need to make a selection of the inside of her mouth because that's the only thing that i want to actually be showing in here so for the inside of her mouth i'm going to click on that background layer at the very bottom i'm just going to use the quick selection tool to do it so the quick selection tool i'm going to zoom in here towards her mouth so i'm just looking for the inner part of her mouth and this is the object finder tool i did not want that i want the quick selection tool i'm going to hover over this remember with your click selection tool you do not want to touch any line that you want it to find so you need a small enough brush that you never touch the lips in here you stay inside so i'm going to start working up in the bigger area I'm going to let go and see what it ultimately does and then i'm going to work my way down into this smaller area down in here sometimes it helps to over select even though i said avoid those uh, uh let, hitting those edges you need to make sure that you capture everything and then once you get that where it's actually selected part of the lip hold down your option key to get the negative quick selection tool and then simply run that along the lines to get it away from the lip part that you don't want it to be selected and I'm going to take care of that part and I'm going to take care of this part and that looks like a pretty good selection to me if you take a look at this though we're going to go ahead and save this selection right now so I'm going to go up to the select menu I'm going to come down and save selection and I'm going to call it mouth and say okay to that and then command D to take a look at this so command D and I'm going to click on the new mouth and this is what it looks like now this edge seems a little too just like we do with the pen tool this edge seems a little too um, 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 uh, hard edge to me so i'm simply going to soften this up a little bit i'm going to come up to my filter menu down to blur down to gaussian blur and i'm going to see what a gaussian blur of like a one pixel will do to this guy 
uh, one pixel, one and a half. I'm going to go ahead and leave it just as a one pixel. Use your preview check mark to actually turn it on and off. And it just softens the edge up a little bit. I actually might even see what a two looks like. The two is a little bit too much for me here. So I'm going to do like a 1.5 and say OK to that. So this is now the mouth that I'm going to use. So I'm going to hold down my command key and click on this to load it as a selection. I'm going to go back up to the top and select the entire RGB channel. I'm going to go up to my new mouth right now, the very top layer, turn it on so that I can actually see it, and then I'm going to add this as a layer mask. So this is the new teeth that I've actually got in here, and you can see that they're not perfect, they're not entirely sized right, but again, we can do the same trick that we've done before to take care of this part. Um, I'm going to break the link between the pixel content and the mask content. I don't want to move the mask. The mask is actually in the perfect place. It's the teeth that are off. So I'm going to click the teeth. I'm going to do a command T again to transform these guys. And the first thing I'm going to do is just move it up a little bit. And this seems actually pretty good to me right now. I'm also going to rotate it slightly. And so I'm feeling pretty good about the teeth that are actually in here. It's pretty close. I mean, uh, I'm going to actually lift it up a little bit higher. But when I begin to lift it up too much, you can see that the teeth in the patch are actually touching lips down here. And so I can't do that part. I can't have those showing. So I'm just going to bring it down here a little bit more like this. And then I'll go ahead and check, click the check mark to say OK. So for me, this is a good beginning to do that, but you can see that the teeth are just completely blown out. So again, I'm going to try my same trick that I did before. How do I make these things darker um, so that it actually fits this scene a little bit better? So I'm going to add a curve on top of my new teeth. Simply click on the adjustment layer, add a curve. I'm going to change the blending mode of this curve from normal down to multiply. It makes everything darker, but then I'm going to clip this curve to the teeth layer that's underneath it so that it inherits the mask that is controlling what is visible and what is not visible. So I'm going to hold down the Option key and click to clip this layer down. And then I'm going to change the... Uh, so the blending mode of this has actually brought this down. It's made it darker, but it's clearly not dark enough. So. There's a couple of options that we've got in here. Number one is you can actually simply grab the top slider of your curve. Even though it's set to a blending mode of multiply, it is making the image darker, but it's simply not dark enough. If you click on the very top and start to drag down, you'll actually see it flattens the teeth out. I don't really want that to happen. So I'm just going to grab the middle part and start to pull it down. And this is not really getting me where I want to go, so I'm going to tear that point off. And I'm simply going to make a copy of this layer, Command-J. You'll see that, again, this is not clipped, but you can hover your cursor between both of those layers. Click on this and clip it to, clip it to the very bottom. So now this is basically where I'm beginning to go here. And you can see I'm beginning to actually achieve the part that I want to achieve in this. It's beginning to pull this down. The problem that I've got with this, though, is I feel like this is also uh, beginning to introduce a uh, color cast in here which I don't want in here. So I'm going to get rid of both of these layers, both of those curves. Shoot. What's the point of making two curves? It doubles the effect. Why don't you just adjust everything in one curve? You can't. I'm only using blending modes to do it. So if I do this, I'll show you what I mean. So the only thing I've done with this curve right here is change the blending mode. If I go back to normal, you can see really bright. This is now actually taking me down to darker. I can't make this, I can come in here and I can actually screw with the curves, but I'm just trying to leverage the blending mode to make it darker. But, so this is the max. So now I can actually though, hit uh, Command J to double it. And you can now see I've got two curves on here that are making things darker. And it doesn't need to end there. I can do another one. Command J again, clip it again. You can keep going on and on and on. But the problem is, is that I'm picking up, sorry. My Photoshop is very unhappy right now. Jesus.
All right, so I've got the two curves on here that are both actually doing that. So I'm going to simply do one more here, clip it. And now I've got three curves on here that are all pushing this to be darker. As you can see, it's starting to pull in color casting. It's starting to do a lot. This is not the solution. So I'm going to get rid of all of those. And instead, I'm going to add a hue saturation layer on top of this. Hue saturation hopefully will let me take care of a number of the issues in here. So I'm going to do this. Let me reset my workspace really quickly. Uh, again, I'm going to clip this hue saturation layer down so that it only, inf uh, only impacts the teeth, only what's in the inside right here. You can grab your lightness slider and start to pull it down. You can actually shift the color in here. You can actually shift the saturation in here. This to me is also not a solution. It simply looks like this is actually uh, uh, graying everything out. So I'm not comfortable with that. So I'm going to get rid of that part. However, remember, I made this thing a smart object. So my next move is to leverage the smart object and a smart filter. So I'm going to come up. I've just got my layer selected now with the layer mask. I've gotten rid of all the, uh, the curves that are sitting on top of it. I'm simply going to come up to my filter menu and come down to camera raw filter. It'll actually take me into a pseudo version of Camera Raw, and I'm simply going to drop my exposure here by a full stop. And say OK. So this is going to run the Camera Raw filter, and you can then see the difference in what I've got going here if I actually hover. Uh, 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 so, so just a, something to, to remember in doing all of this. If you turn off the eyeball for the camera raw filter, it has to regenerate the entire image. You, and depending on how big your image is, that can take a long time. Instead, if you click the layer, the uh, not the layer mask, but the filter mask, if you make it active by putting the little um, by clicking on it, and you'll get the border, the little white border around it, then you can simply invert this, and that'll be your quick on and off. And you can see. It's beginning to do what I want to do, but it's not there enough. It's still too light. So I'm going to double click on the camera raw part to go back into camera raw. And I'm going to take this down another full stop. So I'm going to go down minus two stops and say OK. I think that this ultimately ends up better than trying to do this with a curve and simply making it, you know, dropping it down. So this is now the curve part where I've actually dropped this part down. So this part's beginning to work for me. I, however, I feel like I've got another tint that's actually happening in her teeth. It's sort of like picking up a little bit of cyan here. So now I'm going to take this as my base and I'm going to run uh, hue saturation on top of that. So come down and click. Uh, I add a curve on top of this. I'm going to add a hue saturation curve. I am going to clip this down so that it only impacts the teeth. And then I'm going to drop some of the saturation in the teeth. You can also change the coloring of her teeth uh, to try to fight some of that cyan. We need to pump in some yellow. So again, I'm just dragging my uh, uh, the hue that's sitting up at the very top to sort of bring this part around. I'm not really entirely happy with that part as well. So I'm going to click on the colorized version of this. And you can see doing the colorized version, it puts in a lot of yellow in her teeth. But I can sit there and drag the saturation of this part down so that it's becoming a little bit closer to what I was hoping to have in here. That's still got a little too much yellow in it. And that's beginning to look pretty good right there. I'm going to double click on the hand and kick back out. So again, this would still take a little bit more work to do, but you can see that this is really beginning to move in and get pretty close to this. I still need that drop shadow that would actually happen in there to set those teeth back more into her mouth. But this would be a way of actually re simply replacing her teeth altogether. Questions about any of this? You can close that guy up. We do not need to save that. I want to show you a couple things really quickly. Can you jump online really fast and go to our server? I put a folder up on our server. It's just a copy of the Skin Eyes Retouch um, uh, uh, that I want everybody to grab. I just want to show you a couple things that we haven't done yet. So again, if you connect to our class projects, go to the Engelhard partition on there. There is a file that I put at the 
top level so you can get a hold of it. It's the Skin Eyes Retouch V2. If you can actually copy that to your desktop, you don't need to do anything other than that. I'm going to put mine in my Toss folder. I already have one there. So then I'm simply going to double click on it to load it. So did everybody find this and could everybody load it? Okay. Um, this one is, um, the skin on this is retouched reasonably well. It's not, uh, that wasn't really the goal in all of this, but that's all that's really been done with this. You can see that the hair part hasn't changed in here. However, I think we've talked about this in this class before. Have we talked about how to do contrast that's not done with a curve? A contrast based on luminosity? All right, then we're going to do that part right now. I'm going to change how you do contrast for the whole rest of your life. So typically the way a lot of people will do contrast, if they wanted to bring contrast out in this image like this, is they would simply add a curve to this. So everybody do this with me. We're going to do snapshots of this so that we can compare and see which of these we really like. So if you click on the uh, uh, add adjustment layer, we're going to add a curve onto this adjustment layer. And the typical contrast curve that you have is an S-shaped curve. If you click on the preset drop-down in the properties panel of your curve, you'll see that there is one that says medium contrast, one that says strong contrast. If you just click on the medium contrast, you'll see basically it's an S-curve. That's what it does. It pulls your uh, um, shadows down slightly, makes the shadows slightly darker. It leaves the midtones pretty much where they were, and then it pushes the highlights slightly up. So we're making the highlights a little brighter, the shadows a little darker, that's contrast. If you turn the eyeball on and off, you can actually see that that's indeed what it's doing. I'm going to double click to kick out. The problem that we have with this though is that this um, perverts the color. So you can see it actually adds a huge amount of saturation. Again, if I turn this off, look what this does to her skin tone. That's one of the problems in using curves in RGB is that you cannot change one of the aspects of your curve without changing everything. So even though we're only trying to change tone in this, we ultimately change color and saturation in this as well. Now you can mitigate that quite a bit by changing the blending mode of this from normal all the way down to luminosity. Because this way now, what we're saying is that we strictly want to change the tone in this. We don't want to change anything else. We don't want to shift the color or the saturation. So this is going to be our first way of actually boosting contrast in this. I'm going to come over to my history palette and click on the camera at the bottom to create a snapshot. And I'm just going to call this contrast curve. And say okay to that. And then I'm going to turn the curve off. So that's one way of doing it. What I think is a better way of doing this is a curve, uh, not a curve, but is building contrast actually based on the luminosity of the image. And so that's what we're going to do next. So go ahead and select your background copy to make it active and then come over to your um, uh, uh, channels palette. Hover over the RGB, not over any one of the, of the uh, you don't want to hover over either the red channel, the blue channel, or the green channel. Hover over the RGB channel and hold down your command key and click once and you'll get a whole set of marching ants. And what we've now done is we've actually loaded this thing as a selection. But you need to remember that when we deal with selections, selections and masks are synonymous with one another. So when I loaded this thing as a selection, areas that are light in this layer, in this selection, have been more selected than layers that are dark. Again, I loaded it as a selection and in a selection or in a mask anything that is really light is more selected than anything that is really dark and to see what that actually means come over to your layers panel now click on the background layer and we want to jump this to its own layer command J if you turn off the background layer and take a look at what we've got here you can see that this has selected the highlights of the image you can see that the areas of the shirt which are the lightest areas are most selected the uh, checkerboard is showing you transparent areas. The areas of her hair that are dark, the areas that are the, of her eyes that are dark are virtually non-existent in this selection. So this is primarily the highlights in here is what we've just selected. And then we copied those highlights to its own layer. So I'm going to double click on this layer number one and I'm going to rename it highlights. Uh, and then we are going to do the same process again. I'm going to turn off the eyeball for highlights. I'm going to select my background copy again. I'm going to turn it on again. 
and then I'm gonna go over to my RGB channel again I'm gonna hover over the thumbnail of the RGB command click to load it as a selection again so now what I've loaded again is the highlights I've loaded them a second time but this time I want the shadows so to get to the shadows you need to invert the selection so that's not a command I command I will invert the image take a look it inverts the image that's not what we want to do here command Z to undo that instead we want to invert the selection so go up to the select menu come down and click and select inverse it doesn't look like much has changed except for the marching ant border that's going around our entire image right now you need to then make sure that your background layer is uh, active and we're going to jump this to its own layer command J and now if we turn off the background copy at the bottom eyeball you can see this is now what we've selected here is primarily the shadows you can see that the shirt that was white is now virtually transparent the skin has picked up some those are more mid-tones the eyeballs especially the pupils are fully selected the hair the eyebrows are a little bit selected here so anyway I'm gonna rename this shadows so then here's the trick I'm gonna put both shadows and highlights I'm gonna turn everybody on You'll notice that nothing has changed here because they haven't really done anything. But I'm going to select highlights, hold down my shift key and select shadows. And then I want to group these together in what we're going to call just a contrast folder or a contrast group. So with both of highlights and shadows selected, I'm going to click on my drop down menu for the layers palette. And I'm going to come up and say new group from layers. A dialog box will open up and I'm just going to call this contrast and say okay to that then I'm going to open so again do you have both highlights and shadow layers selected then come up to the menu that's at the far right the hamburger the whatever they call it the the stack of pancakes uh, to the far right of the layers palette click on that and just select new group from layers and a dialog box will open up and you can just call it contrast and both of those layers will now be inside that group did that work okay I'm gonna open up my group right now and the two things we need to do is we need to change the blending mode of our highlights and shadows so select the highlights and change the blending mode of this highlights layer from normal down to screen again we're making the highlights lighter by screening them and then I'm going to click on the shadow, the layer that's underneath it, and actually change its blending mode to the opposite of screen, which is multiply. So now what I've done is I've made my highlights lighter and my shadows darker. But this is not a curve move. This is based on pixel content. So again, I've done this to actual pixels, not to uh, adjustment layer or something that's actually underlining this part. Now, there's no hardcore rule about this, but what I have found in my experience in doing this kind of work is there are times where you need to completely turn off one of these layers. You will turn off the shadows and just use the highlights, or you'll turn off the highlights and just use the shadows, or you'll keep them both at this normal strength like this. But more often than not, what you will find is in a general situation is, is that you want your shadows to be half the strength of your highlights. So in this case, I've got both of these are at 100% right now. But if you click on your shadows and then change the opacity of your shadow layer down to 50%, what you end up having is, is that you've got a shadow change at 50%, but a highlight at 100%. So the highlight change is double what the shadow change is here. And more often, like I said, more often than not, this is the ratio that I end up getting. Now the reason that I've put this into a group is I want to be able to change the overall effect of this, but I want to keep that ratio of having double the highlights or double the highlight change relative to the shadow change. So instead of going in and saying, okay, well, I'm going to put my shadows at 
25% and my highlights at 50%, which would be, again, a two to one ratio, or my shadows at 10% and my highlights at 20%, again, the same thing. If you have them together in a group and you set up this ratio of 100% highlights to 50% shadows, then you can use, click on the contrast group and use the opacity slider of this to simply change the overall opacity of the entire event. And so in this way, I've established the relationship, the ratio of shadows to highlights inside of the group, but then I can just use the overall opacity slider to give me the amount of contrast that I really want to pull in this guy. So I'm actually looking at mine right now, and I'm gonna drop mine down to roughly around a 67, or so it's about a two thirds of percent, uh, so 67% opacity for the entire group. Again, if you turn this on and off, you can see that the contrast that it actually does, and I'm gonna do a snapshot of this, and I'm gonna call this um, uh, uh, luminosity contrast. And then we'll just take a look and we'll see which one we like the best. So I'm going to scroll all the way up to the very top. I'm going to click on the contrast curve version of it. And then I'm going to click on the luminosity version of it. And for my money, I like the luminosity version of this much better. And I don't worry about any color perversion. I don't worry about anything else going on in there. Questions about this. So this is how I do contrast. And everybody thinks that, okay, well, yeah, Verser, beauty fashion guy, that's all you do, blah, 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 blah. You can use this for anything. I've seen people do this. It works great on food. It works great on buildings. It works great on glass. It works great on, on still. It works great everywhere. For me, I've never gone back and done contrast the old way at all. This is how I always do contrast from this point on. I think you'll be happier. Make sense? Okay. Last thing while we're here. So let's say we're going to accept this as our contrast, our, our adjustment. I'm going to throw away the curve that we actually had sitting on the very top of that. So now I want to actually talk about sharpening, specifically targeted sharpening. Now it's really obvious to do this in the case of beauty. So the fact that this is a beauty image, it fits for this. In some cases, this will not necessarily fit for you, but I just want to show you how to go about doing this part. So the first thing that I need to do is actually make a selection of the skin because what ends up happening in this when people do this kind of work is you spend your entire, you know, you spend your eight hours, your 10 hours making the skin look flawless and then you turn right around and you sharpen the shit out of it which defeats the whole purpose of smoothing it to begin with. So we want to be able to sharpen this image but we want to do it selectively. So to do that, the first thing I'm gonna do is make a complete merge stamp version of this. I need a version of this that's got the contrast adjustments that are already built into it. I basically need a final version of this. To do that, hold down the Command, Option, Shift, and hit the letter E, and it will do a merge stamp version of everything that's visible when you actually did that set of keyboard shortcuts. And up at the very top, you can double click on this, and we're just gonna call it Sharpening. So did everybody get a merge stamp version? Did anybody not get this? Okay, my next move in this is to simply create a layer mask. Now, I'm sorry, not a layer mask, uh, selection of the skin. To do that, we're actually going to come up to the select menu and come down to color range. And you'll see in color range, if you go to the drop down menu under where it starts out with sampled color, there is a drop down menu that says skin tones. If you click on this, It'll show you what it thinks the skin tone should actually be. And it's not the worst it's not the worst selection in the world, but I gotta be perfectly honest with you, it's not the best selection in the world either. If you use your fuzziness slider, you can actually modify this slightly. But what you'll see that ends up happening is that by the time I get the hair selected correctly, uh, it's actually, uh, it's thinking that the hair is also the same as the skin color. So it's doing a pretty good job of, of knocking out the uh, the sweater and the, I'm sorry, the sweater, the shirt and the background and that kind of stuff. But anyway, this is not really the greatest selection for me. And I don't have a lot of other control on here. I don't have any of my uh, add to and subtract from uh, 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 eyedroppers. So I am not going to, I don't ever use skin tones just so that you know. Um, and it's misleading anyway. It's all only targeted at Caucasian skin tone. It will not pick up African American skin tone or Asian skin. It doesn't pick up anybody else here. So uh, it's a little deceiving for what it is. I'm going to go up to the very top and go back to sampled colors. 
And in sampled colors, you can't really see what's going on or I can't see what's going on because I've got my uh, 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 image set to grayscale, my selection preview, so I can't really see the image. If you change that selection up to none, you'll actually be able to see your image and then simply click on an area of her skin and it will actually show up on your screen right here. I'm gonna keep my fuzziness pretty low. I'm gonna crank it up to about a 30. I don't wanna go any higher than this because I want something, a different tool to do more of the work. So now that I've actually got some selection made, I can go back and do my selection preview drop down to grayscale so that I get a very big version of my preview. It's just an easier way to see it. Now, instead of keeping just the original eyedropper, because if you use the original eyedropper and you select another area like her cheek, you can see it actually makes that a selection, but it gets rid of the original selection. So you can simply go back and forth for this forever. It doesn't help you out. Instead, click on this second eyedropper, the one that's in the middle. It's got a little plus next to it. When you click on that, you can now then go in and you can click on additional areas to actually add to your selection. You not only can click on them, you can actually click and drag across an entire area and click and drag across another entire area and it will continue to build this. I'm going to go after the part that's right underneath it. So this is now becoming a much better um, selection for me of just the skin. And again, we don't need perfect in this because of what we're really doing in here. We're not going to be trying to knock out the, the, uh, her skin or any of that kind of stuff. We're doing sharpening in here. And so I can be a little bit more lax with this. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yep, I like the way this works. I'm going to try to build a little bit more blackness in the background. You can see that's right behind her above her shoulders. I'm going to click the uh, uh, eyedropper that's got the minus to do that. And I'm going to simply click in that area. And it actually pulls that back really well for me. It brings back a little bit of her skin and her face. But this is working well enough for me that it's a beginning enough for me to actually work with. Finally, I'm going to actually grab my fuzzy slider and I'm going to drag it up. That's not helping me at all. I'm going to drag it down. This is actually helping me a little bit better. So I'm going to leave it around to 25 though, roughly. And this is, again, a good place for me to start and work with. So I'm going to go ahead and say okay to that. So I've now got the marching ants, but I need to continue to work on this to modify it. So I'm going to save it first. Up to your select menu, down to save selection, and call it skin. And say OK, and then hit Command D to deselect, and scroll down to the very bottom of your um, uh, channels uh, palette, and you'll see that you've got skin. Go ahead and click on skin so that we can work on to modify this. I'm going to again grab the B key to get a brush. I'm going to make sure that this is a completely hard brush. A normal blending mode, 100% opacity, 100% flow. White is now my foreground color. And what I want to do is I want to come in here and clean up all these rough areas of skin. I want to make them white. So I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller. And then I'm simply going to paint across all this area where I need to be white. You want to keep her nostrils black, but you want to get rid of the highlight that's on her nose. You can also keep the little um, half moons that uh, sort of delineate the side of her nostrils. We can keep those also as dark, but I'm going to get rid of all of the rest of the little coloring that's actually in her skin. Uh, because again, I don't want to sharpen any of those. Those are all the pores that are actually in her skin. So I'm going to get rid of all the stuff that's up at the top, all that stuff there. That actually cleans up her face pretty well and get rid of all of this part and again the area. Now what we want to keep dark, I'm going to go ahead and finish this up. Um, all the skin that is as her chest and her neck, you can go ahead and get the entire shadow that's actually underneath her chin because that's all skin. And then all of the stuff that's on the top of her chest, you can get rid of all of that. Then I'm going to hit the X key to get black, and I'm going to go ahead and just paint in black for the rest of the shirt, for these little areas that are in the background, for the whole shirt that's uh, her uh, um, sleeve that's up near her face. All of that goes black. All of this goes black. All of that goes black. The area that you see now of her hair that's on the side, that should all be black. You don't want to... Uh, uh, actually, we're going to sharpen that. We just need it different from the skin. 
Her eyes, you'd want her eyes to be completely black. So again, I'm going to paint in her eyes. This whole area, I want that all to be sharp. The selection of her eyebrow is really good, so I don't need to change any of that, but I am gonna make her other eye completely black. I'm also going to make her lips completely black. and her teeth. I'm going to hit the X key really quickly to clean up just the area above her upper lip and just clean that up a little bit right there. That part looks good. And then finally uh, X key to go back to black and I'm going to do all of her hair as black. And again you can see you can be pretty, you don't need to be like perfect with this. You want to be pretty good about it, but it doesn't need to be perfect in that sense. Because again, what we're really going to do with this tool. And then finally, there's an area off the other side of her face that also needs to go to black. So this is going to be my mask now to control my sharpening. However, what's happening here is, is that if I use this as a layer mask, it's going to allow the skin to be impacted and, 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 and keep the effect everywhere else off. I don't want to do that. I want to actually use this. Let me finish up this last bit of area. I want to use just the opposite. I want to be able to sharpen everything except for the skin. So I'm going to invert this channel, Command I. <clears throat> now when I use this, it will protect the skin and let everything else begin to happen. So I'm going to load this as a selection now. Hold down your command key and click on the thumbnail. It loads it as a selection. Come over to your sharpening image. And in your sharpening, I, I, again, I need to do this a second time again. So sorry about this. Command D to deselect. I need to change this sharpening layer into a smart object first so that I can do repeated versions of this. So up to the layer menu, down to smart objects, convert to smart object and then load your skin mask. Hover over the thumbnail of skin, command click to load it as a selection and then add it as a layer, I'm sorry, uh, add it as a layer mask onto the sharpening part. So now no matter what I do to this thing, it will protect the skin, the skin won't change, but everything else will change. So I'm going to select the pixel content of this sharpening layer and then come up to the filter menu down to sharpen and there's a million sharpenings that you can do on this the one that i've been using more lately is smart sharpen uh, but you can use unsharp mask on this but i'm going to go to smart sharpen and you'll see maybe why i actually prefer this guy so in this drop down menu for smart sharpen it works a lot like you have um, uh, um, uh, 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 um, in unsharp mask so the amount again controls the effect the radius slider controls the distance out, how far is really considered to be a pixel. But this one also adds noise reduction to it, which I sort of like in here. I'm going to change my amount. I'm going to leave my amount all the way up at 500, but I am going to change the radius. Mine came up as a three and a half pixels. That's incredibly strong. So I'm going to drop mine down to simply one pixel. Um, the noise reduction is at a 10%. That's sort of a standard on this. And then they use actually different filters to, uh, um, uh, 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 in terms of how they actually do the sharpening. So you can click on this and you can say, well, I would prefer to use a Gaussian blur or a lens blur or a motion blur. The lens blur for this kind of work is the best because the lens blur functions the same way a lens would. Gaussian blur is actually a mathematical model of blurring and it basically is just looking at pixels that are right next to each other and then averaging them together. Uh, and then finally, motion blur is kind of the same thing. It's a pixel level version of blur, but it also adds direction. None of those we need. So I'm gonna leave lens blur as it is right now. However, I want this effect to be really pronounced. I want it to be a little too strong. And when I look at this at a one pixel with a 500 amount here, the eyes look a little over sharpened to me, but that's okay. I'm gonna go ahead and say okay to this right now. And you can see now I've got a layer where the skin has been protected. I, again, the layer mask is hiding that. If you want to see what it looks like on the entire image, hold down your shift key and click on the layer mask. And now you'll see the blur happens everywhere. You'll see what it actually does to the skin. 
That to me defeats the whole purpose that we've softened up all of that skin. Hold down your shift key again and click on the red X to actually allow that um, a, a mask to do its job again. But now you can see that the eyes are more sharpened, the skin is still soft. This is pretty much what we want. If the blur, if the sharpening is too strong on the eyes, all you need to do is drop the opacity of this layer. So if you bring the opacity down to like 50%, this is now only a 50% sharpening that's happening on here. So this allows you to really go in and fine tune how much sharpening that you need for your image. How much sharpening do you need for an image? So here's the trick. It's whatever medium you're actually going to use. So for us, if we were going to go uh, and use this on a website or use this in any sort of context where it wasn't going to stay electronic. So I'm going to uh, uh, use this on social media. I'm going to put this on my website. I'm going to email this to a client. I'm going to, whatever that is, then whatever your image really looks like here on your screen is what you've got. That's what you're going to send out. So you would want to adjust that um, blur according, I mean that sharpening accordingly. However, if you're going to print this thing out, the only way you can ever know is to do a print. You will never, ever, ever be able to preview output sharpening on an image without doing its output, whatever its real output is going to be. There is no way, physically impossible, to preview sharpening for a print on screen. You have got to do the print. Why? Why do you sharpen prints? Why do you sharpen for output? Anybody? Anybody in here? We talked about dot gain in this class. Anybody know what dot gain really is? I would say that I have failed you. So we're going to talk about what dot gain is really quickly again. This is one of those conversations I've had this in the very beginning of what we, at the very beginning of this class, and I said to you guys, if you understand the process, you don't have to memorize anything. So let's think about the process. Let's think about ink hitting a piece of paper, right? So you've got your inkjet printer. It's shooting out little ink jets onto your piece of paper, and that ink hits the paper, and what happens to it? Well, it's the same thing. Imagine taking a paper towel in your kitchen and taking a drop of water and letting it hit that piece of paper. Does that dot stay perfectly, perfectly round? No, it actually hits that piece of paper and it spreads, right? Because the ink is being absorbed into the paper. The paper actually absorbs that, but it's not a perfect, it not just comes down in that single perfect little round dot and that's it, it spreads. That's called dot gain. And dot gain is a reality in all printing technologies. It doesn't matter what it is, whether you're doing CMYK offset presses or inkjet printers that are in there. It does not matter what you're using. This is an, it'll happen. So for us, we need to compensate for that. So what you end up doing is that you end up over sharpening your print. If you've got a, an image that you're trying to judge the sharpening for for a print, you always want it to look sharper. You want it to look too sharp on your screen so that when you print it out and that dot gain happens, it will soften your image. And so what we're trying to do is offset the softening. So if you over sharpen the image for print and then print it, the printer introduces a softening. And hopefully if you get the balance right, they offset one another and your print looks perfectly like your screen would without the sharpening on your screen. Does that make sense, everyone? Who did I lose here? That's why you have to sharpen every single thing that you go to print out. If you don't, you are inherently saying, I want my stuff softer than what I'm seeing on my screen. There's no, there's simply no way to get around that. Liam. So what I ultimately do is exactly the same trick that I'm showing you right now, and I've got this image on top. The thing that you need to remember, for me, is I build what I call a master file. And a master file, I want to be able to repurpose for anything. I want to have it so that I can use it for my website, but also that I can make a print out of it or a poster out of it. If you're making a poster or a, a postcard, those are two completely different sharpenings. So 
for me, I typically will do one uh, a, a sharpening, but if I'm going to do it, so I will get it perfect for screen. That's, that, that would be like my base, right? So I'll have sharpening on there to actually have my screen version of the image. But then there's no reason that just, let's say that I say that this is going to be for my print right here. I could just call this print sharpening right here. The problem is, is that it's impossible to really say what print sharpening should be unless I know what, what, how I'm actually going to print it out. Right, so am I using an inkjet printer, which is actually has less dot gain if you're using like a, a really good quality paper. It'll have less dot gain than you will if, if you're say going to a uh, newsprint, like CMYK printer that's like newsprint. Newsprint is like toilet paper. It absorbs shit, the dot gain for that is insane. So again, you would have to do much more sharpening of an image for newsprint than you would for an inkjet printer that's actually going to glossy paper. What has more dot gain, glossy or matte? Exactly, matte does. That's why if you really need detail in your image, you always print it on glossy. So if you're doing images for reproduction, you would actually print the majority of your stuff. If you're going to send a print that somebody's going to then scan and then print some other way, you want to do it on glossy paper because it has the least amount of dot gain. It will be the sharpest image you have. And therefore, when they then copy it and introduce softness in the copy part of it, at least you've got a fighting chance that it will be sharp. Make sense? So anyway, yeah, but you again, it, it's on a case by case basis, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That's one of the reasons that when you, you you can actually do output sharpening now in camera raw, which is absolutely the worst place to do it. Because that's your master image. And what what output? Do you know you're always going to be printing eight and a half by eleven on an uh, you know an inkjet printer on on Canon glossy paper? Is that the only thing you're ever going to do with that image in your life? Well, that would be the only reason to actually do the output sharpening at the beginning of the process. For me, it's insane. You always do it at the end. So high pass is just the way a lot of people do high pass part is simply another version, another method of actually doing sharpening. It does, but you could still use a layer mask for it. No. I'll, actually, I don't use any of this at all. I actually use the Nick set to do mine, and I would give everybody in here so. The, the resources for how I do my sharpening, um, well, here, I can show you. Uh, I'm going to throw that layer mask away. I am going to throw all the sharpening away as well. So this is just starting with my smart object again. So I actually use a plug-in to do my sharpening. And it's not installed for this version of Photoshop. So um, I will show this to you when we come back from the uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, from the break. Um, but just so that you know, if you take a look, I'm just going to tell you guys right now that because you, you can, it's available to you. You can try it. Um, so if you go into our class projects again, and you take a look under resources, there are two two uh, versions of plugins right here. This is the Nick collection. Uh, this would be the full one that you would want to use right here. This 1.2.11. This would be for Macintosh. This Nick collection full 1.2.11 EXE is for Windows people. So <clears throat> the Nick collection was it's a set of six um, uh, plugins that were created by a company called Nick. Um, Nick decided that uh, the and the original version of it was it cost eighteen hundred dollars. So. But it has a, a, a sharpening plug-in, it has a noise reduction plug-in, it has a black and white conversion plug-in, it's got a colorizing plug-in, it's got a style plug-in, and it's got a black and white plug-in. I don't think I said that one twice. Anyway, um, and it, it was, again, it was an $1,800 set of plug-ins. Um, Nick decided that they didn't want to stay in business any longer, that they wanted to sell it, um, and Google bought it. And Google owned it and you and used it, rolled it into Google Images for years. And then Google decided that they were going to abandon it, and a company named DXO bought it from Google. 
this version that you guys are looking at right here was the last free version. So when Google had it, it was free. So this is the last version that is free. Um, again, DxO has owned Nick software now or the Nick plugin suite now for like four or five years. So uh, it goes way back. The problem is, is that most of you have all updated to Ventura right now. You're probably on the latest, greatest system software. None of these, all these plugins died when Ventura got released. I, on the other hand, and I've preached this to you guys forever, I don't do the latest, greatest software. I do the shit that works. And until something breaks or until Adobe comes, steals into my house in the middle of the night, puts a gun to my head and says, update, motherfucker, I don't update. No longer compatible with my laptop. I know, that's what I just said. It's like everybody's laptop, everybody's upgraded, so this isn't going to help you anymore. But I've been giving this software to my classes for years now, and everybody loves it until it got broken. So if you do want to then get the NIC program that will work with your latest software, you got to pony up like a hundred, it's like a hundred bucks or 120 bucks. Everyone else here. I'll yeah. just go and rush a uh, photography forum and get the pirate version. Yeah, well, and that's the other version that you can do. Uh, so we should have a conversation about that, though. So I will say this. This is the way that I feel about software and software piracy. So this is just, it's my take. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not trying to, this is just my take. Okay, so I'm not trying to change anybody's mind here. I'm not trying to tell anybody this is what you should do or this is not what you should do. This is just my vote on this, whatever. I'm a firm believer in being able to try shit out for a while to decide if it's something I really want to buy, right? So go to the Russian website, get the Nick plugins, plug them in, spend 30 days with them. If you like it, you really should buy the software. You should just like artists, people should pay you for your work. We should pay people who've done their work for their work as well. But if you spend 30 days with it and say, you know, I really don't like this at all. I hate the way this is working out, whatever. I don't want this. Then I... I, again, that maybe I'm calling this a gray area, but I just feel like that 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 every software should have a 30-day trial period. And for those that don't, you can sort of institute your own version of a 30-day trial period by using Russian illegal software. But again, if you find that you're going to use it, you should really pony up with the money and buy it. That's just my vote. Or you can actually load a second version. You can actually develop a hard drive that's got an old version of, of system software and boot your system, old system software and actually use it. I still, there's uh, 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 Photoshop and Band in their 3D uh, 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 workspace like f probably two or three years ago. I still have the last version of Photoshop that runs all the 3D software. So when I need to use that, especially for lighting effects, if I need to use that, I can go back in and just run an older version of Photoshop and I have it all available to me. And the file format hasn't changed, so I can go back and forth. I'm sorry? Oh, no. I don't run them at the same time. Yeah, because then it would. Yeah, yeah. All right, are there any questions about any of this stuff? Uh, okay, this seems like a really good time for a quick break. So I've got, let's call this 1035. You could be back at 1045. Uh, okay, guys, we're going to get back at it. Hello. Um, so something to show you really, just an FYI really quickly. <clears throat> Even though, so I just tried to run this NIC installer for me again. So even though this, uh, these are the, there's only one for Windows, but there's two of them for Macintosh. The uh, um, <clears throat> the version uh, 1.2.11, which I would have thought would have been the newer version, uh, refuses to run on my computer. But the 1.2.04 is working fine. So for whatever it's worth, um, again. Um, I started to do the install right now. It says it's going to take like 20 minutes to do that, and we don't have time to do that. So I will get this loaded in my latest version of Photoshop, or um, if we have time later today, I'm just going to fire up an older version of Photoshop that actually has the Nick Sharpener uh, um, uh, uh, software built into it and, uh, and demo that to you guys, and you can decide what you want to do about that. Uh, okay, there is a sign-in sheet going around someplace. Do me a favor, please get on it. Um, it just started to go around, so it'll be getting to you soon. 
Okay, the moment you've all been waiting for, right? <clears throat> we are moving out of, finally, out of retouching, making selections, all that kind of stuff, and moving into compositing. How many of you guys are, I uh, know, right? Um, uh, uh, how many of you already do a lot of compositing in your own work? So, hands up pretty high. It's about a third of you, half of you. That's pretty good. Um, uh, and then the rest of you, no desire, no interest in it, or it's a possibility, or you'll wait to see what happens, small possibility. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, when we think about putting multiple images together, <clears throat> there's all sorts of things that will trip us up that will give you clues that that's what you've actually done. You've actually you know this wasn't something that that was real or that was shot that kind of stuff whatever so the clues that we need to think about are the general things that we deal with in photoshop so i mean in uh, photography so let me ask you something so <clears throat> if you're thinking about putting two images together what about those images do you need to be concerned about matching in order for it to look real liam perspective and lighting color balance other things sharpness focus other things shadows other things so I'm going to give you my list the things that I look for it's probably worth writing down something to keep in mind so not that this I did this is a pretty exhaustive list or a pretty complete list there are small little things that might turn up in another image or some, another group of images that you're trying to put together that might involve something else, but this pretty much is the umbrella that covers them all. So <clears throat> when we talk about lighting, lighting, yes, but lighting direction is really an important aspect of this. So you can't just talk about lighting. You've got to talk about lighting direction. So it's one of the biggest problems that people make is that they'll put an image together, two images together, and in, the, in, the, in what we would call the base image or the background image, the lighting's coming from the right, and in the, uh, in the figure that they put in, it's coming from the left. It's the biggest giveaway that you can actually have. So, but there are other things that control that we think about in lighting. Exposure is part of lighting. Contrast is part of lighting. But direction is clearly also a part of lighting. Then the other things that are not necessarily lighting specific would be, again, color. But color has got to be divided into separate groups, right? So color, we talk about luminosity, which goes back to exposure. But we're also talking about saturation. We're definitely talking about hue. Um, shadows, we've already talked about that. What about scale? Doesn't scale matter? If you composite a figure into a downtown scene of Chicago and your figure is as tall as the Sears Tower, there's a good chance that most people are going to look at that and say, well, that's composited, right? Um, so scale has a huge, huge impact on this stuff. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, perspective. And perspective is the one that most people, it's the one that people struggle with the most. It's what we're going to start with today. It's one of the most, it's a complicated subject. It's all I can say to you. We are going to go through it step by step. You know me well enough by now to know that this is getting ready to get painful. Um, but hopefully in doing so, I can get you to really appreciate and understand perspective, but more importantly, uh, 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 really um, uh, uh, bring control of that into your composites and it will change everything for you. The one thing that I say to everybody about perspective before we even jump into it is, is that a lot of times when you're looking at an image and you say to yourself, well, there's something that's just not quite right here, but you don't really know what it is, nine times out of ten it's perspective. It's a mismatch of perspective. So we're going to talk about what perspective really is, the clues that you need to look out for, the things that will actually help you do that work. Um, all of that kind of stuff is where we're going to go. That's where we're going to start with today. So with that, I really want everybody, so I've got a working file that I want you to uh, actually open up and do this work with me. Uh, again. You can just sit here and watch this on the screen, but this is going to be deadly boring if you don't do the work. And so I'm going to ask you to do the work, please. Um, and if you get lost in a step, you already know I tend to lecture and work re pretty quick. Um, stop me. Please just stop me. It's so much easier to get you caught up than it is to just lose you for all of today 
um, and then have that impact all the work that you do from this point on, because this is going to be all the work that we do from this point on. Uh, for the most part, we do a little bit of other stuff as we get sort of toward the end of this class, um, but compositing is going to take over for the next at least two, three, four weeks. Okay. So the file I want everybody to open is if you go to our session nine today or in this class, I think it's in session nine. This is session nine, hard to believe. <clears throat> it is a folder called Perspective. And if you click on that inside that folder called Perspective, there are four files. Well, there's three files in here. Um, as well as a, a, a PDF. The PDF is about transforming in perspective. We will, um, uh, we will take a look at that because we are gonna be doing transforming in perspective. But the file that says 01-01-perspective is the file that I want you to open up into Photoshop. So um, there is a huge shout out in this. This is not my file. This is a file that was actually created by a guy by the name of Jesus Ramirez. So, um, how many of you guys do have favorite YouTube channels for retouching? Anybody? Worse. Who? Worse. Oh, <laughs> that's very sweet of you. <laughs> I'm going to show you the three that I actually go to all the time. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I'm going to show you the I'm going to show you the 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 ones that I go to, and but wait, but but also the reason I do this is that. It's a shout out to these people. These are people that I've learned stuff from. The reason that I'm really doing this right now is that because Jesus Ramirez is the guy who runs, uh, it's called the Photoshop Training Channel. He's also a Photoshop uh, like guru. He's in deep with Adobe. Um, uh, uh, anyway, he did this course on perspective and he was also, he's a 3D artist and he was really into doing a lot of 3D work in, in, in Photoshop. So um, uh, this is not only his file, but there's a number of figures that he's actually built in here in 3D, and they're 3D models, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, it's just a shout out to Jesus Ramirez for this because it's his file, um, but it actually helps illustrate all of the issues that we deal with in perspective extremely well. So um, he's one of my favorites. So again, I'm gonna show everybody here really quickly. So if we go to YouTube, <clears throat> and we'll do start with Photoshop training channel <clears throat> and this is Jesus Ramirez's channel right here the guy's brilliant uh, again there's there uh, he's definitely should be on your list the next one that I think uh, Liam was possibly talking about, or actually uh, someone is talking about, um, is this guy right here, Amoosh. And this is at Piximperfect. So again, if we take a look at, this is Piximperfect channel right here. Um, I, I mean, this is ridiculous. This guy's got 5 million subscribers and, and almost 1,000 videos but he really knows his stuff really well. So anyway, second guy that I go to, and then the third and the last one that I actually go to is Flurn. And this is run by Aaron Nace. Um, and Aaron is actually, um, he, he used to, I don't know where he lives now. He used to be here in Chicago. He actually, co-taught uh, this class one semester here at Columbia. Um, uh, anyway, um, a brilliant guy. Um, so anyway, those are my sources, the people that I actually go to when I'm trying to figure out something and I don't know how to do it or I'm looking for something or whatever. Yeah, Jesus Ramirez at Photoshop Training Channel. So it's Photoshop Training Channel, Flurn, and then uh, Pix and Perfect are the three places that I go to. Um, and we will use um, files from uh, uh, Pix and Perfect as well, possibly today if we get to it. If we don't get to it today, we'll be doing working with it next week. But anyway, it's a huge shout out to these people because they have put in not only their time and effort, but now I'm actually using their resources, and you guys are using their resources, and it's it's just it's worth recognizing and 
and giving them the shout out. And again, if you guys subscribe to their channels, um, it's building their base and it's what they want. And so anyway, that's, that's all I've got for this. So anyway, if you open up this uh, uh, perspective file, double click on the hand to get it as big as you can get it, you'll see that there's a series of color-coded um, uh, layer groups here that we can actually look at uh, and talk about or think about here. I'm gonna start with the red group. It's actually called diagrams. If you click on the eyeball for this and then actually click on the drop open to open up the, dia uh, to open up the diagrams, <clears throat> at the very top, you'll see that there's nested groups inside of it. And the first one that we'll hit, uh, working our way from the top down, is one point perspective. If you click on that, you'll actually show there's three cubes. So just to give you some idea of this space, this is a 3D space. Again, it's illustrated. It's not a real space, but that works for our purposes right here. Again, this is Jesus Ramirez's work. He's created this 3D space. He's created these cubes. And so these cubes are supposed to give you the illusion of three dimension, right? I mean, it, this is what Renaissance art was all about, or not all about, but that was one of the innovations that happened in Renaissance art was the whole idea that they really began to introduce what we would call a realistic perspective, the sense that you really had depth in an image. And so that's basically what we've got going on here. So when we talk about having these things in perspective, we need to talk about a couple of things. And the first one is if you scroll down in this group, you'll come down at the very bottom, you'll actually see a thing that says uh, vanishing point. It's a group that says vanishing point. If you click on that, it'll actually show you a series of green lines that are running right along the, uh, uh, the outlines of the cube. So if you take a look, again, if you turn it on, it's, it's difficult to see it on this screen that's up here, but if you turn it on your screen, you'll actually see that it's tracing lines along the very top edge of the, of the cube. On this case, this cube right here, there's lines that are converging lines that are coming off of this cube. There's another one coming off this front face. There's for the uh, face that we can see on the cube that's floating up in the air, there's also converging lines coming off that as well as there are on the other side. These converging lines ultimately go back and recede and end up at a van what they call a vanishing point. So they are converging all the way back to what we call a vanishing point. You can see that in the case of all of them, they all land at the same vanishing point. But the other thing that's important to know about this is that that vanishing point sits on the horizon line. This part's critical for us. Horizon lines determine a huge amount in what we deal with in perspective because we deal in photography and photography unlike illustration or paintings, that kind of stuff, whatever, sort of commits ourselves to um, uh, 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 3D spaces that we're in and horizon lines, stuff that we can't actually alter or change. So at any rate, if you also click underneath that the vanishing point group on the horizon line, if you click on that, you will see that the horizon line, by definition, always bisects the vanishing point. So the thing to remember about this is that all in, if anything is in your image that is in perspective, it will have converging lines. Those converging lines will always meet at a vanishing point, and that vanishing point will always be on the horizon line. So then if we come up into the group a little bit higher in the uh, red group, you should see there's another group called Free Cube. If you click on this, you'll actually see that you do get another cube in here. To check to see if it is in perspective, if you go right underneath it in the group, you can click on and add its uh, 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 vanishing point lines as well. And you will see that <coughs> its vanishing point does not land the same place as the other vanishing points. That's not a problem. As long as its vanishing point does land on the horizon line, this cube will be in perspective. If you turn off the vanishing point for that free cube, select the free cube group, hit the V key to get the move tool and drag that cube up. And I'm just gonna float it up in the air up here above my horizon line. Now, when you look at this image, I think you would agree, hopefully, that everything in this image looks correct, except for that cube that's floating up in the middle of the air. 
And the reason it does not look correct is because it is no longer in perspective. The converging lines, if you turn them back on, you will see the converging lines go back in space. They don't land on the horizon line at all. And that is a clear indication that this thing is no longer in perspective. And you say to yourself, well, this is as abstract as I can possibly get. This is the shit that happens nine times out of 10 in your own perspectives, is you're doing this. You don't realize that this is what's happening, but this is what you're doing. And without it being in perspective, it is just, it's, it may not be blatantly obvious. Again, you just have this sense that there's something that's not right about this, and this is what it is. Make sense? Are we good on this part? Okay. You can turn off the eyeball that's next to the one point cubes or the one point perspective. You can turn that off and if you scroll down, you'll see that there's another group that's still, we're still in the entire red group uh, that's, you know, it's been uh, flagged with red. There's a thing that says two point perspective if you click on that and then drop their window open, so what happens in a two-point perspective is unlike the first scene that we saw, in this case we can actually see multiple planes. Now, the multiple planes, the way I always try to think about this is if you look at the cube that's in the very middle, imagine this is a building that you are shooting on the street and you can actually see the front of the building and the side of the building. If you have that, you have what is called a two-point perspective. If you open up your two-point perspective, you can actually turn on its vanishing points, and you'll see, because it is a two-point perspective, you have two sets of converging lines that land on two different spots in your, on your horizon line. It creates two vanishing points, one for the front plane, one for the side plane, or one for the right plane, one for the left plane, however you wanna phrase this all. But this is basically what's going on in here. And in this case, all of these are in perspective. Does this make sense everyone, what's going on here? Again, both of those vanishing points have to land on the horizon, or it is not in perspective. We good on this part? Shoot. If the if your vanishing points are landing on it, the higher or lower part of the horizon line all has to do with perspective of your camera, right? So if you're shooting extremely low, your horizon line actually will be low in your image. If you go extremely high, it will actually creep up into your image. So if you imagine, so let's just imagine that the, there's a horizon line that the, the, the back edge of the wall right there, let's just call that our horizon line and let's just say that's it, right? <clears throat> Barb, do me a favor, stand up really quick for me, will you? So Barb is my subject and I'm gonna shoot that horizon line right now. I'm gonna take a picture. Well, right now when I'm looking at her for where my, this is my camera, my camera height right here, right over, that horizon line is bisecting her right about where her waist is. If I come down like this and I shoot, I'm down on the ground, so I'm really down shooting low. Now that horizon line is bisecting her right above her knees. If I go up really high like this, that horizon line come down on her, that horizon line will be cutting through her shoulders. So the height of your horizon line in your image all depends on the position of your camera. How high or low your camera is relative to the horizon line things. You should actually, you know, say that you're a professional model and that your agent will be in touch with me for the hour of work that you just put in and that your rate's $200 an hour plus plus t a minute. Yeah, oh, I didn't go over two minutes, all right. We'll, we'll negotiate later. Okay, thanks. Can I get it in can No. Uh, okay, uh, again, if you click on the horizon line, you'll just see what we already know. The horizon line bisects both of those points. You can turn off the two pers point perspective line and then finally click on the three point perspective. So three point and go ahead, it's a group, open it up and you can actually see it does have vanishing point as well if you click on that. What happens in a three point perspective is that you will have two of the three faces will have converging lines that establish your horizon line. So if you think about this, imagine that this is a, uh, well, just imagine this is some sci-fi cube that's floating up in the air. Uh, that's what would actually sort of be going on in here. So this is a three point perspective. However, you'll end up with one face will give you converging lines that simply lands up in the free space. It will never be on the horizon line. It's not meant to be. 
However, if you actually come up to your image menu, so come up to the image menu and come down to image rotation and rotate your image 180 degrees. So Pedro, this is uh, hopefully will go, ex I mean, so Pablo, this will go exactly to what you were talking about right here. So this is a case where I've actually flipped this image. So now you can imagine this being the top of the building and we're in a helicopter looking down on it. So again, my horizon line now is actually above the height of the building. And I still have two faces that are going to give me converging lines that land on the horizon line and then one of them that's just floating out in free space. Make sense? We good on this part? Okay, you can turn the three-point perspective lines off. You can collapse the entire diagram group. And the next one we're going to go to is people. So turn off the red group. Oh, we also need to get our image unrotated again. So go back to your history palette and go back one single step to undo the rotation. Turn off the diagrams group. You can collapse the red group. Turn on the, click on the people group, the eyeball for the green one, and open that group up. And this again is uh, an illustration. So the, this is a 3D uh, illustration that Jesus Ramirez actually built, not just of the background, but of uh, the figure. And so what we need to notice about this and something that's critical about this, again, I take that back, hang on one second. I think we missed one thing. Let me just check to make sure. Yeah, it's the top to bottom. Uh, do me a favor, turn back, turn the people group off, go back, open up the red group again, turn on the eyeball for the diagram part, go down to the very bottom, turn off the uh, um, uh, the three-point perspective eyeball and turn on the top to bottom boxes. This is the last thing we really need to talk about in here. So can everybody find this? Okay, so what you'll notice about this is if you take a look at the horizon line, it really establishes what we can see in the boxes. Now instinctively, we know this. But if you take a look at the box that's on the very bottom, we are able to see a huge amount of the top part of the box. I mean, the, obviously the one that's above it is hiding it, but if there were no other boxes, just the one on the bottom, we would be able to see all of, quite a bit of the top of the box, but none of the bottom of the box at all. If you go to the next one up, the second one up, so I'm working from away from the bottom of the image up to the top, whatever, you start to see, as we start to get closer to the horizon, you start to see less of the top part of the box. We still don't see any of the bottom. If you go to the third one up, you actually almost are losing the top of the box right now. You still don't have any of the bottom. If this box was exactly on the horizon line, you would not be able to see either the top or the bottom. But once we actually get to the box that's now slightly above the horizon line, we lose all of the top of the box, but we start to see a small amount of the bottom. As we go up higher, as the box goes up to the, the now we're up at the number five box right here. One, two, three, four, yep, five box up here. Now we're really beginning to see quite a bit of the bottom, none of the top, and then finally the box that's on the very top. If none of the boxes existed, you would see a huge amount of the bottom of the box, but none of the top. And this makes sense to everyone instinctively, right? Is there anything about this that's confusing to anybody? Okay, then click on underneath it in the red part, the thing that says car. Is this car in perspective? Why not? How do you know it's not? Well, it doesn't look like it, but is that all? Can't you tell me why? I'm sorry? Exactly. So I can see the top, some of the top, very small amount of the top of the car, right? I can't see any of the bottom of the car, but the car is above the horizon line. I should be able to only see the bottom of the car and not the top if it was in perspective. Hit the V key, grab the move tool, click on the car, and simply drag it straight down until you feel like it is actually in perspective. And it happens when you get just below the horizon line and you actually, at that stage of the game, does this now look like it is in perspective? Yes, it does. And it all has to do with the visual clues that you know. And this is the problem with perspective is, is that you have experienced the real world for many years. 
and instinctively you know that these things happen but the awareness of that really calling that out in a class like this and really saying okay you need to think about this if something is above the horizon line you cannot see the top of it if something is below the horizon line you can't see the bottom of it we instinctively know that but to actually articulate that and then bring that to your compositing work is the whole reason we're going through all of this make sense all right so now you can go up to the top and turn off the red group and collapse it the diagram group turn on the people group and again the first thing this is now done in reverse order if you go down to the very bottom of the people group that's where this guy uh, his eyeball is actually turned on so the next thing that we need to talk about in perspective is is that no matter how far away from the camera you are the horizon line will bisect a person of the same height always at the same spot no matter where they are this one fucks up a lot of people but if you take this figure a copy of this figure and you push him back into space he will never his shoulders will never drop below the horizon line it does not matter how far back you push him he will always be at the same spot to see what that really means if you click on the man eye, uh, eyeball right above it don't turn the first guy off keep him on but turn on the next one this is a copy of the same guy slightly different pose but you can see he is further back in space which makes him smaller but look at where the horizon line bisects both of them the guy the big guy right here it's bisecting him pretty much in the middle of his uh, uh, upper arm if you take a look at the second guy he is also being bisected exactly at the same spot by the horizon line because he is in perspective. If you then go up one more layer, there's a guy number three. If you click on that, it's a guy way, 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 way far away from the camera. He is still in perspective and he is because the horizon line is still bisecting him in the same spot. This is another one that people fuck up with all the time. They have no qualms about changing the heights of relative people in their images, whatever, and it can never happen. They would never be. It, again, you look at it, you say, well, there's something wrong here. I don't really know what it is, but there's something wrong. Nine times out of 10, it is perspective. Does this make sense to everybody what's going on here? Okay, if we scroll up one more, there's a, a, the next layer up is called squat one this is the same guy he is not being he is in perspective but he is not being bisected in the same spot why not right so the first guy is six feet tall the guy who's crouching down is three feet tall so he is in perspective if he stood up that horizon line would be bisecting him in the same spot make sense okay we can go to the next one up though and if you'll see this, the, again, the horizon line relative to the guy squatting is going to be the same. No matter how far back he goes, he will never break across that horizon line if he is in perspective. You can actually click on squat number three and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Really small little guy that's sitting there in the back. Does this make sense to everyone what's going on? Okay best trick in the world that there is and why this all matters uh, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit here I want you to select the man number one select this guy right here you can transform in perspective this is one of the things that we actually use a ton in compositing and that's what we're gonna do right now so how do you transform in perspective well, the first thing is you just need to select the image. So select man number one, that layer. Hit command T to bring up the transform dialog box. Make sure that you can see the anchor point. If you cannot see the anchor point, again, there is a <coughs> um, options bar at the very top. On the far right, uh, left hand side, there's a little check mark that you can put in that little white square that's right next to this weird series of icons this is supposed to look like the control handles on a, a, a on a transform box uh, or a transform border but so does everybody have their um, uh, um, anchor point showing so here's the trick about transforming in perspective you need to put the anchor point on the horizon line so I'm gonna click this anchor point and I'm simply going to drag it over onto the right side and put it right on the horizon line 
Everybody good about that part? Then I'm going to grab the lower corner of this transform box, so the lower left-hand corner, hold down the Shift key and the Option key, and click to reduce him. And what you will see is he is going to travel back towards that anchor point, but he is transforming in perspective. If you go ahead and do a check mark and say OK to that, you can see that the horizon line is still bisecting him exactly right through the middle of his forearms, no matter how far back he got. Command Z to undo that to bring him back to the foreground. So you'll also notice that when we did that, he actually traveled towards the anchor point. So we're going to do the same thing again, Command T. We're going to put the anchor point now on the other side. And then I'm going to grab the other. I, you can actually grab the exact same anchor point again that we did before. Again, Shift, Option, and click on that same corner. It doesn't matter which corner you select. He is going to transform in perspective relative to that anchor point. So he is now moving in the other direction. But you can see again that no matter how far I get him back there, it is still, he is transforming in perspective. That uh, uh, horizon line is still bisecting him exactly through the middle of his forearms. I mean his uh, uh, upper arm. Is this working for everyone? So, Command T to bring up the transform dialog box. Grab the anchor point and drag it back and lay it right down on the horizon line. Did that work? No? depending on where you put your anchor point, he moves in that direction. So if you want, let me cancel out of this all together. Uh, if you want to just move him straight away from the camera, you put the anchor point right behind him. So again, Command T to bring up the transform dialog box, drag the anchor point up and set it right, I'm going to put it right in the middle of his chest, but what I'm really looking for is, is it on that horizon line in the background? If you can't really tell, you can grab a guideline. If your rulers are showing, if your rulers are not showing, again, the view menu down to rulers, have a check mark next to your rulers. You can grab a guideline out of your uh, out of the ruler and just bring it down and set it on the horizon line. And then you'll know exactly where you need to put your anchor point. And then again, hold down the shift key and the option key and simply click and it actually will drag him directly away from you. However, it gets better. If you click in the other direction, you'll bring him closer to your camera. He is now still in perspective, but he is way closer to my camera. But again, look at where it bisects his arms. It's exactly where in that middle of his upper arm, he is still in perspective here. So this gives you an enormous amount of freedom. If you can establish the horizon line, you can actually transform in perspective till the cows come home. Did I really just say that? The fuck about cows, I guess, I don't know. I didn't grow up on a farm. I guess cows coming home matter. Yes, Liam. If I'm not doing what? Uh, this has got nothing to do with shadows right now. Oh, absolutely it would. So, again, but, but the issue is, is that we're now talking about the relationship of a camera, a horizon line, and a figure. Right? So the lighting is completely independent of this. Lighting has got nothing to do with this. Lighting is its own thing. Uh, we're going to get to that. But right now, we're just dealing with perspective. But, but you're absolutely right. Yes. If, I had, if it was an artificial light source, it wasn't the sun. It was a street lamp. Are the figures that are closer to the street lamp going to be hotter than the figures that are further away from the street lamp? Of course they will be. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be 
not in perspective. They will still be in perspective. If it was a real shot, they would all be in perspective. And when we go to recreate something like that, we need to have them in perspective. And then we need to actually make the figures that are closer to the light hotter and the ones that are further away from the light darker. And, and you're also right, the angle of the shadows. Depending, if they're right under the street lamp, the shadow is going to fall pretty much right underneath themselves. If they're 50 feet away from the street lamp, the street lamp is going to cast some shadow from them kicking out away from the, where, you know, the opposite direction of the light. Right, so then you would change the shadows. That's the end of today and all of next week. Shadows. We've already touched on shadows a little bit. You already know how I feel about them. It's like this endless process, but anyway. Uh, okay, finally, uh, I'm going to hit cancel out of that. Uh, if you scroll up again a little bit more, you can hit to, you get to woman number one. If you click on her, you'll notice that with her, um, uh, let me get rid of this. Um, Guideline. I don't need it. With her, the um, uh, the horizon line is not bisecting her between her um, uh, the uh, her the middle of her upper arms. Why not? She's shorter than the guy, but she is in perspective. So if you then turn on the next one, woman number two, you will see that no matter how far back she gets, the horizon line on the figure that's really close up to the front, whatever, is is breaking right across the top of her shoulders. And it's doing the same thing if she's still in perspective, no, way further back in my image, which is fine. And then finally, turn on the very last one. They call it woman on a box. So this, she is in perspective, but she is no longer being bisected. Now the horizon line is bisecting her waist. Why? Because why? Exactly. She's now 10 feet tall. She's on a box. So she is still in perspective relative to our scene because she is now she's not a, a five foot eleven woman she's now a ten foot ten woman because she's standing on a four foot box make sense okay you can turn off that eyeball for the entire group and collapse that let's look at something real click on samples and go ahead and open it up does this look right to you No. What is it? Again, this is what I've been trying to say to you guys here. You look at this and you say, that's just not right. I know that's not right. Now, you might not know what it is. You might say, well, it's the lighting is off. Well, the contrast is off. Well, there are no shadows really to speak of here. That part's off, whatever. The truth of it is, it is perspective. So, to find out... <coughs> Where's the horizon line of the beach? Yeah, you can tell it's, it's the horizon line, right? It's where the waters and the sky and the water actually meet. It's right here, right? Where's the horizon line of the guy? Well, if you click on the man group, go ahead and open the man group up, you'll see and click on the layer where the guy actually is. It's an image that's, uh, that's been knocked out. He's been masked out. If you hover over the layer mask of the guy and hold down the shift key and click, it will turn it off. You can now see this is the original picture where he was shot. Where's the horizon line in this picture? Well, you can still see again, it's where the sky meets the ground, right? It's like right above his knees. That's where the horizon line is for the guy picture, right? So click on the, hold down your shift key and click on the layer mask again. So I need the two to match. Right now he is out of perspective. To actually put him back in perspective, click on the layer that says beach, hit the V key to get the move tool, and simply drag the beach line down to the point that the horizon line of the beach lands just above his feet, I'm um, just above his knees. This guy is now in perspective. When you look at this now, does this not look like a far more believable image? The part that you said was off is now fixed. It is now on. Again, hit Command Z, wrong. Command Z, believable. 
Does this make sense? Shoot. So if we're like the observing the photo result is the horizon line, like how we're judge. Well we're gonna get to all of that. Does this make sense so far? I just want to make sure I'm not losing anybody at this stage of the game because we're getting deeper into this. We're all good? All right. Um, if you click on the <coughs> turn off the beach and click on the city that's right underneath it, this guy, is he in perspective? He is because the horizon line of the scene of the city is right above his knees, which is where his horizon line was. So again, if I want to transform him in perspective, I'm going to select the guy image. I'm going to hit Command T to bring up the transform dialog box. You'll notice in this case, I've got this giant set of, of uh, 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 um, uh, transform lines that are around this. That's going to cause me a problem. Uh, if I want to make it smaller, it's not a problem. But if I want to make it larger, it is a problem. So I'm going to hit the uh, circle at the top of the slash through it to cancel out of that. I'm going to hit the F key once to go to the pasteboard. This is really where you want to be doing your transforming. Because again, the pasteboard allows you to use your tools outside of the image, which is at times what we need to do. So I'm going to, again, the guy is selected, Command T to bring up the transform dialog box. And I'm simply going to grab the uh, uh, anchor point and I'm going to drop it out on the, uh, this would actually be somewhere in, in Jersey. I'm going to put it over on the right hand side all the way sort of towards the back, but on the horizon line. And then again, hold down the shift key and the option key, click on the lower left hand corner and I can float this guy out into space. He is still in perspective. He's now a superhero floating above New York. I'm going to hit Command Z to undo that part to bring him back. But again, if you want to bring him closer to your camera, move the anchor point so that it's right on top of him. So I'm going to put it right between his legs. But again, the anchor point has got to go onto the horizon line. And then holding down the shift key and the option key, grab one of my lower anchor points and start to pull him towards the camera. How many of you guys would have thought that if he was in perspective that I would lose his head by bringing him this close to the camera? None of you would have suspected that, but he is in still in perspective here. And if it wasn't done this way, your composite would be wrong and people would know. Yes. Not on his body, no. No, we're, we're going to get to, there's, we've got one more example to show you, um, which will probably answer part of that question. Uh, okay, I'm going to hit uh, the circle with the square, uh, with the slash through it to undo that whole part here. And I'm going to turn off the cityscape and turn on the last one the subway station. So how do we figure out where the horizon line is? We don't have an obvious horizon line in here. Yes. It would be where the vanishing point is. But sometimes in this case, that's actually really obvious. In other cases, it's not very obvious. So I'm going to show you guys how to establish the vanishing point of a scene. So temporarily turn off the eyeball for the guy so he's just gone. You'll see that there's a couple of shadows. Don't worry about those. Those can stay there. So what we need to do is the way you establishing establish where the horizon line is, is that we need to establish where the vanishing point is. Because again, the vanishing point is always on the horizon line. We can use their elements that are in this image that will actually give us converging lines. Now, some people will do this using uh, uh, um, um, uh, 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 a brush tool or a pencil tool, that kind of stuff. I actually do this using the pen tool because it's just a temporary thing that we need to sort of save. I am going to stay on the pasteboard here. It's important to do that when you're using the pen tool because it'll allow us to set points outside of the image. So it's just a more flexible way of doing it. So I'm going to hit the P key to get the pen tool. Make sure that in your gear that's in the options palette at the very top, if you click on that gear that you have the rubber band selected so that we can actually see it. And then I'm simply going to start with converging lines. So if we take a look at the marble um, uh, um, um, uh, armrest, sort of the area that's, you know, uh, 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 um, 
uh, delineating the staircase that's actually going down, whatever. There are converging lines on here. So I'm simply going to click on this edge of the marble and I'm going to then drag all the way to the other side of my image using my pen tool and then I'm going up and down so that I get my path to run right along that very same marble edge and I'm simply going to click and put a point out there. Then I'm going to come in and I've got other points that I can actually use to do converging lines with. I can do the railroad tracks, that would be a converging line. I can do the uh, 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 the rooftop that's actually on the uh, a building, that would be a converging line. Uh, I can actually do parts of the train, if I can figure out the painting part of the train, I could probably do converging lines there. But for me, I'm just going to keep it simple and I'm going to do the railroad track, or actually I'm going to do the edge of the um, the edge of the brick walk. So that's the one that I'm gonna use. So I'm going to click a point there, and then again, drag all the way to the other side of my image, and then uh, move this line back and forth until I get it to transcribe exactly along the edge of the walkway and click where these two points come together are my horizon line. And again, you guys picked it up right off the bat. You could see that there was everything was converging to this and that this was the vanishing point. But this is just a confirmation that that's actually happening. And this will not always be the case. There will be times where you don't have something that's this obvious. If you want to actually establish the horizon line and keep it visible, again, you can simply click on the ruler and come down and drag a guideline out and drop it right on the intersection of those two. If you have problems in your ruler, your guideline doesn't want to, it, it wants to snap one side or the other. If you hold down your control key, it will uh, get rid of that snap to automatically behavior and you can actually drop it right where those two lines intersect. That is your horizon line. If you then go to your path palette, you can throw away your work path. You don't need to keep it. It's done what it's needed to do. This is the horizon line of my image. Now I can come back to my layers palette and I can turn the guy back on and you can tell me what's the problem here. Is this guy in perspective? No, he is not. Again, the horizon line of the guy is right above his knees. So I'm going to click on the guy, hit the B key to get the move tool, and I'm going to jack him up till it's just sitting there right above his knees. Is this in perspective? It is, but the guy's now 20 feet tall. Why? Shoot. I'm sorry, what? No, there's a reason that this doesn't fit. There's a reason that this guy's over 20 feet tall. Yes. We can actually transform this guy in perspective, so let's try it right now. So again, with the guy, he's now, the perspectives are matched because he's been moved up. The horizon line are the same for both of them, right? So Command-T to transform the guy. I'm actually going to drop the anchor point right on the horizon line, hold down Shift key and the Option key, and transform him back into the train in perspective. But look, as he transforms in perspective, he's just as tall relative to the train all the way back into the station as he was where he was in the beginning. He's still 20 feet tall. I'm just going to answer it because we could talk about this forever. It is a mismatch of perspective. The train station was shot with somebody standing up at least as tall as me, but probably actually up on something, probably up on a ladder, something like that. The guy was actually shot with people almost on the ground. So again, the train station, you won't see this on the video, but you'll see it here. The train station, my camera's up here shooting down. The guy, I'm down on the ground shooting up like this. That mismatch can never be undone. That is just a reality. The only way to solve that is to reshoot one of the two. And you've got to use the same perspective. This is just, again, something you need to keep in mind when you're actually shooting for your composites. This shit matters. So you can't go in and say, oh yeah, I'm gonna stand up on top of this ladder and shoot down on the train station, but then I'm gonna go into the studio and I'm gonna get down on the floor and shoot up a hero shot of this guy. You will never, it will never, ever, ever work. There's no way to fix this. So you can do a couple of things. It's a cheat and it might work, but we're gonna find out right now. 
The biggest problem we have with this guy is the scale. Can I scale him correctly from a scene? I can. So I'm going to hit this uh, uh, the circle with this, the slash through it to undo that part right here. I'm going to temporarily turn the guy off. I'm going to get rid of this guideline. I'm simply going to, if you have the move tool selected, you, you can actually move the guidelines around. You can just drag it off. I'm going to turn the guy back on now so that we can actually see him. <clears throat> and the first thing I'm going to do is actually transform him. I'm going to scale him relative to the train. So this is the way you need to start thinking about your composites, is to scale him properly. You need to find stuff in your scene that you know the scale of. So what in this scene do you feel like really confident that you know its scale? What? The door. You're absolutely right. It's the door to the train. Right, so I am not going to bother with any sort of perspective issue right now. I'm just going to transform the guy. Command T to bring up the transform dialog box. Click on the link between the width and the height. And I'm just going to make him smaller. And I'm going to put him down. And I'm going to get him close to the door. And I'm going to actually zoom in. So again, I'm going to continue to make him smaller. And what I'm trying to do is get him relative to the door. I want to put him in the door. So again, I'm going to continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then I'm going to stick his foot right on the edge of the door. Again, you don't want to put him down on the ground because the step to the door is a foot step up. So I can't put him on the ground right now. However, I can realize that he is still too tall right now. His head would be hitting the door, so he's out, still out of scale. Again, I'm going to continue to make him smaller here and reposition him again so that his foot is standing right on the edge of that door. And then I'm thinking about it. How tall is that door? Aren't doors taller than people? Does he have to duck to get into the train? No. This is about right. You can figure him. Just imagine him when you're standing getting on a train. Can you actually see into the window of the door? You can. That's why they put windows there. Right? They don't put windows like at your, you know, knees. They put windows where you can see shit, right? He can see in here. He's not, you know, I wouldn't make him this small. I wouldn't, like, actually do this to him. Unless he's a kid. Right? So, again, I, you know, the, you can use your judgment for this. But if we get him in close to this part, this looks about right to me. I would have him slightly above this. Again, he tall guy, whatever, he's, you know, an adult sort of figure, whatever. So this is how I would scale him. He is scaled correctly now. You can go ahead and say okay to this. That, oops, sorry, that was a mistake. Close enough. The thing about scale is, what controls scale in photography? Exactly, distance from what? Distance from subject, distance from camera to subject. Controls scale, right? If I want you bigger, I'm moving closer to you. If I want you smaller, I move further away. If I want you smaller, I move you further away. I want you bigger, you move closer to the camera. Either way, it's the same thing, right? But that leads us to this. If he's scaled correctly here, I can move him right to left and he will always be scaled correctly. I'm not moving him right to left does not move him any further away from me. It doesn't move him any closer to me. It's just where he is. So I can actually then move him now, the V key. I can drop him down on the ground right in front of the train. He is still scaled right. I can actually hold down my shift key and move him right and left. Holding down your shift key will restrict your movements to either right or left or up or down. I can move him all the way over here. He is still scaled correctly. So I establish my scale on something that I know, and then I can move him around in here till forever. The problem that I have with this, though, is he is still not ever going to be in perspective. But this is my next best thing. At least I can get him scaled in my image to match the rest of what's going on in my image. Are we good on this part? Alrighty.
You can hit the F key again to get to the black pasteboard, F key one more time, and close this image up. You don't need to save it. Okay, I'm going to show you something really quickly. <clears throat> if you've got um, uh, uh, if you've got Capture One on your computer, you could actually do this with me. Uh, you don't need to do it with me, though. It's not going to take very long. I just want to show it to you really quickly. So in the overlay exercise, there is an overlay session in here. If you double click on the uh, session uh, preference, it should launch you into <clears throat> Capture One. I'm hoping that this does not bring my computer to its knees. Okay, so shooting composites. What is the best way that you can do it? Let's start here with the very basics. Do you shoot your, uh, and again, I'm gonna keep this the way I do it. Again, shooting fashion, that kind of stuff. You guys need to simply modify these, these groups or the conversation that we're having for the own style of work that you do. But, so I want to take this figure in the studio. This was actually a really, uh, 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 this was a, a real um, um, uh, coat catalog that I actually photographed for this, all on green screen and they wanted it in, in the woods, right? So anyway, that's what I ultimately ended up doing. Do I do the figure first or the woods first? Why? So the interaction part is correct, but the first thing you said is even more correct, and it's the lighting. Yes. Perspective is a big issue here, but lighting is the biggest issue. So I can go into the studio, and it's not like I can do any lighting in the world in the studio, but I have a lot of flexibility in the studio, and I can change things relatively quickly, right? But if I, set, if I do my studio shooting first, then I've got to go out, and I've got to try to find an available light situation that matches the studio lighting. I, because I can't re I can't move the sun. I can't go in and say, God, I just should put the sun over there really quickly, and I'll be good to go. I can't do that, right? So then I'm really driven by actually having to match my lighting in the scene, in the background, and that forces me to actually choose backgrounds that maybe I don't want to choose. Maybe I, I want the background to be, you know, the L train, or I want the background to be this given tree, or I want the, you know, I want the background to be the lake, or I want to, you know, it's so easy for me to go shoot a picture of the lake and then go into the studio and say, oh, it was a really overcast day, so I just throw a bunch of lights up in the ceiling and make it a really overcast day in the studio. Or the sun was setting and it's a really hard light, it was sunset in the studio, it's, you know, whatever, well, I can go in and recreate sunset in the studio, I, so I'm good to go. But if I do the studio shit first, I'm telling you right now, you will spend an exhausting amount of time trying to find a scene that the lighting matches that you're happy with. So always do the harder stuff to light first, and that's usually the backgrounds, right? So <clears throat> that's what I actually did. I shot the backgrounds first. So if you scroll, um, just take a look at my screen. I'm gonna scroll down here. <clears throat> I've got a single image in here. What can you tell me about this image? What is this helping me do? Go for it. True. What else? Oh no, the colors are gonna match exact. So this is another incredibly important thing about your compositing. One of the hardest things to put together are images that are in two different colors, right? I've got a really warm image, a really cool background, right? So the target for what you're hoping to have doesn't matter. What matters is that you have them starting at the same point. So I've got a color card that I'm gonna shoot uh, in the, uh, out in the woods. This girl's actually holding it. This girl's actually my wife, so I should, uh, anyway, so. <clears throat> Debbie is holding this card. So it gives me um, I, I can actually go in and uh, do white balance on this and I've got perfectly neutral color. I can go into the studio and do the same thing. I then put both of the images together because they have perfectly neutral color. 
and then I can color grade the entire image. Then I can make the whole thing blue if I want it, or really warm, or really cold, or black and white, or I can do some weird color semi grading, or I can do all of that. But the trick is, is that if you start with them both completely neutral, they go together automatically. And then you take your composite and regrade it to whatever color that you want it to be. Does that make sense? It's so much easier than having a really warm background, a really cool thing in the studio, trying to put them together, trying to then adjust one to actually match the other. You will just hate your life. Yes. If you're harvesting an image, again, so much of what you harvest, you can find a white point, and that's all that matters, right? So you don't need a card. You don't, I mean, again, it's a great idea that you could build a color profile and do all of that kind of stuff, but here we're basically looking at white balance and nothing else, yes. Oh, so, so no, this, get, this gets better right here. So what I've done here is... So not only is the girl holding the card that's going to give me my, my, uh, uh, the, the white balance on this, right? I have perspective in here. I know where she is relative in my scene. I have scale here. I know how big she is. Without the figure in here, I have no idea. That could be a redwood that's, you know, 20 feet thick, right? I mean, there's nothing in here that's really screaming scale to me. So I've got a figure in there that's screaming scale. I've also got that white card, I mean, that uh, uh, color card in there. So exposure. Don't I have exposure control in here? Don't I have the white patch that's supposed to be between 245 and 250? If I do that for my figure in the studio and I do it for this figure that's out in the woods, aren't they then going to match? Yeah, so aren't I ticking off all the boxes that I've got on here to try to get this shit to match? Yes. Right. We're gonna get that. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. All of that's gonna happen right now. I'm just trying to get you again. Remember the list that we went through. Lighting direction. Can I determine the direction of the lighting from this figure in the woods? Of course I can. You can see it. Overcast day. Top heavy light. Right? Isn't that what I need to recreate in the studio? Yeah. So I get that from this Im image. Right? Uh, exposure. The white patch on this. The white patch and the girl in the studio. Same thing. Exposure. They match. Correct? Right? Contrast, that's a big one. We still need to look at that one. That's not a given in this situation here. Because in the studio, in most cases, you even if you're trying to recreate a really overcast day, unless you can light up, unless you've got a studio that's got really tall ceilings and you really flood the entire top of it with light, you're gonna end up with more contrast on your figure that's in the studio than you are in the, uh, uh, than the woods. But you can balance that. You can reset the contrast. I can drop the contrast in my figure here and I'll be fine, I'll be good to go. Um, color. We've already talked about that. My white point here will give me that. Saturation, that's another one that actually can be a mismatch. We're going to look at how to balance that part. Um, the shadows, isn't this going to tell me where my shadows are? Of course, I've got all of that in there, right? The scale, again, I've got the scale right here. I already know how big a figure is, right? So having a figure in your scene to start this with is a huge advantage to have, especially if they've got color card information, all of that. That's how you need to think about generating your composites. If you have all of this common information, it makes your work so much easier to do than if you were just like, you know, winging it. Make sense? Uh, okay. Um, let's get through this part and we'll see where we land. Um, I would love to give you another quick break, but that may not happen. All right. so. This is my scenario that I've actually got here. What I do when I'm actually shooting this then in the studio, again, I've done my background first. I've also got a version of the background that does not have the girl in it, right? Because that's ultimately going to be the goal. So I'm going to take this version that does have the girl in it, and then I am going to come into one of my uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, tools here. I actually put this in my... Uh, in my uh, um, uh, the uh, tool palette for the camera. So it's called overlay. If you open up overlay, <clears throat> you can actually add pictures here to this overlay part. I'm just gonna show you how I do this. So I'm gonna take the girl that's actually in the woods, my wife, I'm going to drag this on top of the overlay part and let go. It'll actually put her in the woods right now. You can actually then click on the image that's not got the girl in it, and you can actually see this is what overlay really means. 
If I turn off overlay, you can see that I actually hide the image on the background. If I use my opacity slider and push it in one direction or another, you can see it lets me see both of these relative to one another. If you click on the hand, it'll allow you to move the overlay image. So I'm simply going to bring it down to try to get them to be about the same, roughly about the same size. You can also scale your overlay uh, image in here to sort of match that part. So basically what I'm doing is sort of matching the two up. And then what I've got now is if I take a look at my scene in the background, all the rocks that I've got in the background, I recreate that using sandbags in the studio. Why? Exactly, exactly. I get her feet to pitch correctly. I get her feet to pat, to pitch, you know, the, what it would look like if it was if it was actually on those rocks. Um, if there's part of her shoe that's being hidden, I mean, I, I'll pick up that information. I mean, all of those things, the more I can recreate in the studio that mimics the situation that I've actually shot in, the more believable my comp's ultimately going to be. Yes. So, no, that is not my horizon line. The metal bar is actually, there's a whole nother shot that I did from this very same group where a girl is actually holding her arms out on a tree that had actually fallen over. And so it's a sort of a really horizontal branch. And she's just, so this allows me to get her arms out and actually grip this, which then allowed me to take that and transfer it to the tree branch that she was then gripping and holding onto. It is not my horizon line. Are we good on this part? So this helps establish everything that I need to shoot. First things, shoot outside. Do it that's got a figure in it that's giving you as much information as you can possibly have that pertains to what you want to composite. And then go into the studio and try to match this stuff as, 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 in the best way that you possibly can. Perspective. In the studio, this is going to be how high am I uh, with my camera. So I'm shooting this stuff right here, roughly about this height, and that's roughly about where I was shooting the trees from. So it's roughly the same perspective, and I know that part. There are ways, I'll show you later, that you can actually uh, establish what a horizon line would be in the studio. Um, but we've got a lot to get through but first before we get to that part. Is everybody good on this part so far? We good here? Okay. So... I'm gonna jump out of this capture one right now and I need all of you to do the same thing with me. We're going to actually start this. So if you go into your session number eight, there is a folder called build background. I take that back. Tree, yeah, it's called tree exercise, sorry. So there is a folder inside your session nine called tree exercise. And if we take a look at it, <clears throat> there is a set of raw files in here. Um, the first one I want to deal with are the trees to begin with. That's where we're going to start. So there is a trees 013, so it's a frame number 13, and then a trees 019. You don't need, if you have XMP files in there, that's fine. It doesn't matter. If you don't have them, that doesn't matter. Just um, select both of the trees and then hit Command O to open them up. They both should come into uh, Camera Raw together. So did everybody get this stuff in the camera raw together? Anybody not? All right, so my first move is to just zoom in on the color card and do a white balance. So that's all I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna click on the color drop down menu. Let me get my camera raw as big as it'll go. Say what? Ah, she is. Um, anyway, I'm going to click on color. I'm going to click on the uh, uh, white balance tool, the eyedropper. I'm going to come over and click on the white pa on the gray patch that's right next to the red. I'm going to hover over just to see what my exposure was like. And you can see that my exposure here is correct because, again, I'm, I'm knocking on that 245 door um, here. So the exposure is correct. I've now got color, uh, a neutral balance color in here. <clears throat> so then I want to apply all of this same to the image that does not have the girl in it. So I'm hovering over the uh, thumbnail of the girl of the image that has the girl in it. At the top right hand corner, you get the three little dots. Click on those three little dots to come down and do a select all, which selects all of your thumbnails. Then go right back up to that same little three dots on the thumbnail of the girl that's got uh, in the woods and come down and do sync settings. All we are doing here, all that you really care about is the color. That's the only thing that we've really changed in here. So at its default, 
It has all of these other ones checked. It's fine. The only one we're really using is the color. So go ahead and say OK. Now both of these images <coughs> have the same white balance and they are the same exposure. Yes. Okie dokie there. drag them on top, drag the files themselves on top of the Photoshop icon and it'll force it to open in Photoshop. Did that work? Okay. So then you want to open both of these now. We're going to open both of these. I, I want the girl with the car, but I also want the background that doesn't have that in it. Now, in my case, this is set to open as objects. It doesn't matter. You can have this open as smart objects or not for, for the work that we're doing right now. You already know how I feel about smart objects. I would always use smart objects, so I'm still going to do that right here. But I want them both to open, so I'm going to click on Open Objects. And we've got two of them right now. Again, this is why I do not use tab behavior. I like to be able to work with both of my images available and, uh, and visible to me. So the first thing that I need to do is actually bring the girl in to the set that does not have the girl in it. Again, I'm only temporarily going to use her for scaling and that kind of stuff. So click on the image that has the girl to make sure it is the foreground image. You will see that she is now on a layer. Grab the layer, drag the layer on top of your uh, image that does not have the girl in it. Hold down the shift key and let go and it will actually bring her in, in centered into that image. And then go back to the tree image that has the girl in it and close it up. You don't need this. You do not need to save it. It's done all of its work. You should now have an image that has two layers in it. One of it's got the girl in it and the other one that does not. Everybody good on that part? Okay. They are slightly out of register because I, when I was shooting this whole thing, I was hand holding this. So I want to keep this as smart objects. We could select both of these layers and then come up to the edit menu and come down to auto align layers. But you'll see auto align layers is not available to us. And the reason it's not available to us is that you can't auto align smart objects. So the cheat around this, this is a very old school trick that everybody used to use because auto align layers didn't used to exist. If you double click on the hand to make your image as large as you can get it, click on the girl layer that's at the very top and change the blending mode of the girl layer on the very top from normal almost all the way down to difference. If you click on difference, what will end up happening is she becomes sort of like psychedelic-y kind of thing. You're going to ignore her. What we are not going to ignore, though, is the stuff around her. So what happens in difference is, is that anywhere where you have something that is identical in two layers, it will go black. Wherever you have something that's, not di that's, that's different in both images, you will either have some sort of color or white. So for us, I'm going to hit the V key to get the Move tool. I'm going to click on my top image, and I'm simply going to start moving it down and around. What I'm trying to do is get this image to go as black as I can actually get it. And as I start to move down, you can sort of see where it's beginning to line up, especially the rocks are beginning to go. So uh, again, if it really mattered to me this much, and to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter that to me that much, whatever, but this would be another way that you can actually line stuff up uh, to do that. In this case, I'm going to go all the way back up to normal because, again, it doesn't matter. It's not really critical to what I'm doing right now. So then I'm going to go back to that same folder again, and I'm going to grab the two shots that were actually done in the studio. So. Again, back into your tree exercise folder, the frame 001 and the other frame that is 0047. And I'm going to drag both of those onto Photoshop icon. They both should come into Camera Raw. They both are in Camera Raw. I'm going to zoom into the image. It's actually got the card in it. I'm going to grab my white balance tool. I'm going to click again on the uh, uh, gray patch that's right next to the red. Again, I'm going to go up to the three dots that are at the very top and do a select all. Then I'm going to go back to the same three dots and do a sync settings and say OK. 
And then finally, I'm only gonna click on the image that does not have the color card in it. I don't need to open the color card for this. It's done everything I needed it to do right now. So with this, I'm simply going to open one object in here. <clears throat> I'm gonna hide everybody else. And now again, with the girl on top, I need to go back to my scene and make sure that your top layer is selected because when I drag the girl in the studio onto this, I don't want to drag her in in between these layers. I want her to be on the very top layer so I can sort of do my scaling and my positioning. <clears throat> so again, I'm gonna go back to the studio version right now. I'm gonna click and drag her into the, on top of the wood scene. Hold down your shift key and let go. It will bring it in into scale. Then I'm going to drop the opacity of this top image down so that I can see the other image that's underneath it. I'm gonna then click, uh, hit the, again the V key to get the move tool. I'm gonna click and place the girl. What I'm gonna do is I wanna put her, um, uh, the girl's uh, in the studio's right foot on top of the girl that's in the woods' right foot. I wanna actually anchor something so I have something that's common so I don't need to keep doing Transforming, moving, transforming, moving, transforming, moving. If you actually line up something that you want to be fixed, then the rest will fall into place. So I've got it uh, set up where I've got her foot. The right foot of both of them is matching. One's right on top of the other. I'm going to hit the Command T to bring up the Transform dialog box. I'm going to grab the anchor point from the center, and I'm going to drop it right down on the toe of her foot. So this way it's now going to anchor that right foot and the scaling will happen outside of all of that. So her foot won't change, everything else will. So then I'm gonna click on the link between the width and the height in my options panel at the very top. I'm gonna to hover over H for the height and I'm simply going to drag to actually make her taller. So Lenny, going back to your point right here, how do I know how big to make her? So. I know that my wife is 5'8", and she's wearing sneakers. So she's about 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, I know that the model is actually 5'10", and she's in heels, which means she's probably about six feet tall. So I know that she needs to be taller than my wife, but how much? Well, how much is it from the eyes to the top of my head? It's about four inches, and that's about the difference that we're talking here. So I'm just going to continue to scale this height so that the girl in the woods' uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, eyeballs are at the top of my wife's head. And this should now be scaled correctly. Then go ahead and click on the check mark to do that. Grab your opacity all the way back up to 100%. And then throw away the girl. You can turn the eyeball of the girl that's in the woods, uh, I mean that's in the studio. You can throw away the other image of the trees to get rid of that. And then we would simply have to knock the girl out. I'm also going to get rid of the version of the girl that's in the studio that was by itself because I already copied this over. I don't need to save that part. So this is basically where I'm at right now. The girl is in the woods. Now, I've already got a knockout completed of this. So if you go back into your, uh, again, your tree exercise, there is a file in here that says composite body. If you double click on that to bring that into Photoshop, you'll actually see it's already, I've just developed the knockout of her. That's all this really is. I'm gonna hide everybody else. And then again, I'm going to grab this composite layer, drag it on top of my, uh, um, my the composite that I'm building in the woods, in the studio, hold down the shift key and let go. <clears throat> in this case, mine came in underneath the composite, underneath the studio shot. So I'm simply going to drag it up on top so that it's now showing. And then I just need to scale the figure that I just brought in so that it matches the scale that's actually of the image that I've already got. So this would be, an, uh, uh, again, I'm simply going to <coughs> move it up till their uh, right foot touches each other. Uh, and in this case, they are actually, it's already scaled and it actually already is. I just needed to move her in position. So she is now in position. She's a little bit bigger, but it's still not gonna be the end of the world. So I'm gonna go ahead and accept this part. I'm gonna throw away then the version of her on the green screen. And so now I've actually got the whole situation now. I've got the girl is in this scene. 
she is now, her exposure is matching, her lighting is matching, her scale is matching, her color is matching, her perspective is matching. So I've ticked a whole lot of boxes in here. Is this making sense to everybody what's going on? Now, we did simple shadows of this girl before. Everybody remembers that part. We used the gradient tool to do that. So I'm not going to go into that part of it today. I'm just going to finish up with this part of it and how we ultimately will try to match this part. Everybody good on that part? All right. So uh, I'm going to close up the other image that's actually got, um, uh, uh, that just had the girl already knocked out. So this is my composite right now. At this stage of the game, I would go ahead and save this. You can see that, you know, she's, can I fine tune her positioning in here? Yes, I could. Can I do a couple of other things? Yes, I could. But what I'm really concerned about this stage of the game right now then is matching the girl, all the other aspects of this girl to the scene. And to do this, this is one of the things that you don't learn in compositing until you're getting into it really deep. But I'm like, fuck that. Everybody in this room is more than capable of handling this. So I'm going to introduce you to, the. I think, the most powerful tool that there is actually in doing compositing, and it's called check layers. Anybody in here ever heard of them or ever used them? Okay, we're going to start with the simplest of the check layers of all, um, and then I'm going to show you... I'm going to actually give you an action to build all of the check layers. You don't need to really go into this. I'm just going to point this out to you. If you want to understand how to build check layers, uh, what's really going on, uh, we'll go again. I'll, I'm going to show you one. There's actually several that we're going to use. I'm going to show you one. I don't want to spend all our time, though, building this one. I know you can actually just read the PDF of how to build this. But I do want to start with something else first. And the thing I want to start with, I will just do a brand new file for me. So just, a, again, we've done this all the time, a synthetic file. Command N to just bring up a blank file. I'm going to use my drop down menu to do inches. And I'm going to do 10 inches wide by 8 inches tall by 300 pixels per inch. And I'm just going to go ahead and say OK to that. So then with my ruler showing, I can actually click and drag a ruler out. And as I get to the middle of it, it should snap to my screen. So I just, I'm just trying to cut this image in half. Uh, I'm going to then click on my foreground color and I wanna make a pure yellow. So for a pure yellow, if we click on the, uh, um, uh, the value for your red, I'm gonna type in 255 red. Hit the tab key and go to green and put in 255 for my green and then hit the uh, tab key to go to blue and put in zero for blue. And that is a pure yellow. So then I'm going to hit the marquee tool, the M key, or just the, again, the rectangular marquee tool. I want to select this whole area of the left hand of my image. So I'm going to click and drag down. We've already done this in our selection part of this class. I'm going to click and drag down and I get the marching ants, but I need this corner, the top left corner to be in the top left. So hold down while you're still holding down your cursor, hold down your space bar. You can actually move this around and jam the marching ants up into the upper left hand corner and still holding your cursor uh, down, your mouse down, come down and finish the rest of the selection. And just, it should snap to the guideline. <clears throat> I'm going to add an empty layer above this and I'm going to fill it with yellow. Yellow is my foreground color, so option delete fills it with yellow. Now I want to make the other side the opposite, a different color. So I'm simply going to go up to my select menu and do inverse. It's now selected the other half of my image. I'm going to open up my foreground color picker and change this. I want a pure blue for this. So again, I'm going to click on the red and put in zero red. Tab key to go to green and zero green. Tab key to go to blue and put in 255 for blue and say OK. <clears throat> Blue is now my foreground color, option delete, command D to deselect. So you should have something that looks like the Ukrainian flag. Nope. It's okay. I have a lot of Ukrainian flags here though. Thank you. 
Would you guys agree? If the yellow is lighter, the blue is darker. Wouldn't you guys agree to that? You would, wouldn't you? Who in here doesn't? What? Would I didn't say saturation. So which is lighter? Saturation is purity. Lightness is luminosity. Right? Which is lighter? So here's the trick. This is the thing that fucks everybody up. Come up to your image menu right here, down to mode, and let's just, I'm sorry, adjustments, and let's just do a uh, desaturate. Turns out that Lenny was correct. These are not, one is not lighter than the other. They are exactly the same brightness. When we made them, they were both 100% brightness. When we strip out the color, they are exactly the same luminosity. But that is not how human eyes perceive things. Human eyes perceive black and white as, I, I mean, colors as having very different luminosities. And this is one of the things that fucks people up. When they do check layers, people who do not know what they are doing will simply do a desaturation like this or put a luminosity, I mean, a black and white adjustment layer on here. They'll do something to get rid of the color. The problem is, is that when they get rid of the color, they do not maintain how our eyes perceive luminosity. Our eyes perceive yellow as lighter in a grayscale world and blue as being darker, but that's not what's happening here. That would then fuck this check layer up. If I had a check layer made that would actually do this, that would actually fuck it up. So hit Command Z to undo that. We're gonna go ahead and build the check layer to actually do the proper way to do luminosity. And hang on one second, I need to get to my check layer here. <coughs> Okay, so to do it, to build a proper check layer for this, come down to your, we're going to add an adjustment layer on top of this. So click on add adjustment layer and we are going to add a solid color. In the solid color layer dialog box that actually opens up, we are going to set the hue to zero degrees. So again, type in for H, zero, hit the tab key for saturation, put in zero as well hit the tab key and for brightness put in 50. So we have created a um, generic middle gray here and go ahead and say okay to that. And then we're gonna change the blending mode of this. So I've got zero for the hue, zero for the saturation and 50 for the brightness and say okay. Now change the blending mode of this layer from normal down to color. And you will see that you have, again, uh, this has shifted everything to grayscale, but this is radically different in that perception. This is how your eyes see this shift of color to black and white. Does this make sense to everybody what's going on? Are we good on this part? What do you mean no? That means this is now actually transferring. This is exactly the problem that you were having when you did your simply convert to grayscale. You change everything to be equal brightness. And that's not how our eyes see black and white in the real world. That's why you use a black and white adjustment layer. A black and white adjustment layer will do this better than a desaturation part. You can actually try this with a black and white adjustment layer. So just add in a black and white adjustment layer and you'll see it still keeps a difference in the two of them. But that is not what a true grayscale conversion does in Photoshop because, again, the brightness of these two is identical. So, does this make sense where we're going with all of this? Okay, I have actually created a series of actions that I need you to load. 
that will give you all of the check layers that you need. And we need to load that set of actions right now. So to do that, you can close up this uh, image that we were just working with. You don't need to save that. To load these actions, go to your actions palette, click on it, <clears throat> click on the drop down menu of your actions palette, and you wanna say load actions. So again, I've got the actions palette. I've clicked on the pancake hamburger thing, menu thing that's on to the right side of that, coming down and I wanna pick load actions. So click on load actions. And then again, you need to navigate to the folder that we have been working in, our number nine folder. So session number nine. So up to the Columbia retouching session nine. Inside yours, there is a, a thing called check layers set dot ATN. You need to click on that and then open it. I'm not going to do that for me because I've already got 10 of these sets in my possession. But once you do that, <clears throat> over in your actions palette, you should have a thing that says check layers. Can everybody find that? This is mine right here. Has everybody got that part? Say what? So again, click on your actions palette, load actions, and you are navigating to your session number nine for this class. In that student folder, and it's called check layers set dot ATN. You find it? Got it? All right. Now that you have it, you need to find it in your actions palette. And mine is right here. Can everybody find their check layers part? We good? All right. And then you're just going to run it. So come down to the little arrow that's down at the bottom and click on it. And it will actually do this to your image. Your image should look like shockingly saturated and a couple of other things. Is everybody good on this part? Did everybody get this? Say what? What's it saying? Yeah, there's weird things that keep happening with your We got to get through this. We got to get through this. There's still quite a bit we got to get done today. Yes. All of yours did what? Wait, what? Oh. So, wait, what layer is not visible? So for us, oh, we I don't have this thing down here visible. Yeah, ours is on. <clears throat> yeah so don't worry. We're gonna turn. We're gonna turn all of this off. We're gonna start and go through this one at a time. This is not where we're gonna start. This is where we're gonna end. Okay. So, but did you have weird shit happen to your image? That's all that matters. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Great. So we're gonna take a look at this. We're gonna take a look at this. So, it is a group called Check Layers. It sits right on top of your image right here. The top two ones, the hue saturation and color check layer, I'm going to turn both of those off. They work as a group. They're a set together. So it's the hue saturation and color does the check for color for your image. But for the time being, we're going to leave that off. 
We're going to come down. There is another saturation check layer, and then there's a luminosity check layer, and that's the one we're going to start with. So if you click on the luminosity check layer, you'll see that it turns your image black and white. And what we are looking for here is a way to balance the figure with the background. So when you look at this, does this look believable to you? No, there's a contrast, there's a massive contrast mismatch, right? The woods is relatively normal. The girl is pretty heavily contrasted, right? That's a problem. She's also darker. She would be much lighter. If you imagine her in these woods, there's no way that jacket would be closed up in this dark, right? I mean, look at the tree next to her. So there's clearly a mismatch here. This is the thing that helps us balance what that mismatch is. So I'm going to show you, most of us know, we've talked about ways of adding contrast right now. How do you subtract contrast? So most of you would say, well, you do the inverse of an S-curve. Instead of actually having the S-curve where your shadows are darker and your highlights are lighter, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to do an S-curve where your shadows are lighter and your highlights are darker. And if you do that, you will fuck up your image. There's nothing that looks uglier than that. So you can't use curves to actually reduce contrast. You can use it to boost, but I still don't think it works that great. So to reduce contrast, this is the thing, because this is going to happen to all of you, right? This is for the assignments that are coming up. To reduce contrast, we are going to work on our image. So our composite here, it is a smart object. That matters to us quite a bit um, because we are going to do this. This is, unfortunately, this is a filter, but it is not in the filter group. It should be, but it isn't. So I don't design this shit. I'm just the messenger. So to fix the contrast on the figure, Make sure that you select the figure, the composite is selected. <clears throat> Come up to the image menu, down to adjustments, down to shadows and highlights. So again, can possibly one of the most important takeaways in this class today is this. So if you click on that, it will actually open up a shadows and highlight control slider here. If you have a very abbreviated version of this, you can click on the show more options check mark at the bottom of this and you'll get the same full screen that I get. By default, this thing leaves the highlights alone. You'll see there's three sections of this. There's a shadow section, a highlight section, and then an adjustment section. The adjustment section we don't touch because we do all our color work independent of this. We would not, uh, you'd never do it here. Um, the highlights, that's not our problem. The highlights were set correctly because highlights are established by exposure. And our exposure was correct. In the studio, that white patch was sitting there on that 245 to 250 range. So the exposure was correct. It's the shadows that are blocking up. That's what's causing this problem. And so you'll see that, and it always comes in this way, it always does a default of 35% to lift your shadows. The tone, this has to do with what we are really saying is shadow. So they put the tone here at the 50% mark, saying that shadows are zero to 50% and highlights are 50% to 100%. You can change this, but there's no real reason for us to modify this right now. Uh, and then the radius <clears throat> all has to do with how far out or how far away from a, a point that we would consider to be a tone, how far away something is from that tone that will still be impacted by this slider. For the most part, you can leave this at its defaults and only work with the uh, uh, amount slider. You can go in if you get really good at this and play with the tone slider a little bit later. But for our purposes right now, the amount slider will work well for us. So when I'm looking at this image right now, I'm saying I'm trying to feel like, okay, does this jacket match the background right now? Or the way I would feel that this jacket would actually be in this space. You can use your preview check mark to turn this on and off and say, does this fit better in this space? And I gotta be honest with you, the 35%, it's at its default, seems to work pretty well for me. If you crank your thing up, you'll see that things just continue to get lighter and lighter. I don't think that bumping it up is helping me. Dropping this down to actually maybe a 30%, that might be a little bit better. I'm looking at her skin tone of her face. And so maybe I feel like this works a little bit better. There's an area of her jacket in the middle that's way too dark. So I may lift that using something else. But so I'm going to do around a 30, 35% and I'm going to go ahead and say okay to this part and just to check to see how this worked. So you'll see it is a, <clears throat> a smart filter now. So 
If you get this wrong and you need to adjust it again, you simply double click on it, it'll open it right back up and you can actually adjust the percentages to make it open them up more or less and say, so anyway, I'm gonna just say okay to this. To see how well this works, then turn your luminosity check layer off and you can actually see, you're taking a look at it right now, does this actually fit the background better? From a luminosity point, I would say yes. From a color and saturation point, I would say no. But again, we have not run our color or our saturation check layer to actually make this better. Does that make sense, everyone, what's going on? Okay, really quickly, I do want to fix the area that I see is right in the center of her jacket. I do want to lift that part up. So to do that, I'm going to add a curve adjustment on top of this uh, uh, composite. So I'm gonna simply add a curve on the top. I'm gonna set the blending mode of this to screen, which really opens things up. But then I only want this to impact my image. So I need to hover over the point where this adjustment layer meets the image layer, hold down my option key, click on the drop down menu so that this is now clipped so that the screen now is only impacting the figure. And then finally, I'm going to make my layer mask of this black by inverting it, command I. And then I'm going to grab my tablet and a brush, the B key, I'm going to make it a soft brush, completely soft. Come on. Normal blending mode, 100% opacity, and a 2% flow. Maybe 3% flow, two, three, four, somewhere in there. Hit the X key to make white your foreground color, and then zoom in to the image where it's really dark in here and just start painting in this area in here, just scrubbing back and forth to lift the shadow areas that are in here. And it lifts it pretty well. You can turn this on and off to see how much it's lifted. It's lifted it quite a bit. If this is not enough for you, duplicate this layer, Command J. When you do Command J, you need to make sure that, again, you re-clip it. So holding down the Option key and clicking to clip it only to that central area right here. You can now see that we're actually lifting all of this. I think that that's too much lift on that color, so I'm actually going to throw that second layer away. I was just sort of like showing you. <clears throat> There's other ways that you can do this. If you don't do the blend mode to screen, I'm going to change this back to a normal blending mode. I need to lift the shadows. The mask is probably in the right, the mask is probably good. But if you click on the bottom point, the white black point of your shadows and bring it straight up, you'll actually start to lift that area to match the surrounding background. I think that that's actually better than my uh, screen trick. It looks better to me. So this is now what I've actually got going to actually lift that area. And I feel like that part is actually working pretty well for me. So I'm gonna double click on the hand. <clears throat> so now from a luminosity point of view, the two match better. Wouldn't you guys agree? It looks better as the black and white. And then when you turn this off, it also looks better in my, in my image. Are we good on this part? Okay, so the next part I'm gonna go after is color. I'm gonna do color before I do saturation. So to get color, you need to come up to the very top. The two check layers that you need to turn on. The first one is the color check layer. And if you turn that on, you get basically what an LED image looks like without the luminosity. This is just showing you the color. However, <clears throat> it's really hard to see this. I mean, these are very, very, very subtle colors. So uh, the reason I've added the hue saturation layer on top of it is it really amps this up so that I can see the difference. And what you can see that's happening in this is I've got a color mismatch. The girl, her outfit is primarily blue, but the whole rest of my scene is primarily yellows and oranges and, and reds, and it's really warm. This is a color mismatch that I need to fix. So to do that, scroll back down to the images. This whole adjustment stack has got to stay one on top of another because you need to have these clipped to the figure so that you're only changing the figure. So I'm gonna click on the curve adjustment layer that I was just working on 
and then I'm going to add an adjustment layer on top of that. And the adjustment layer that I'm going to add on top of that is color balance. So I've got color balance that's actually on here, but I need to do two things immediately. The first thing I need to do is clip this layer to the one that's right underneath it. Hold down the Option key, click on the link, uh, hover between the two layers, click so that we've now... Son of a bitch. What? <clears throat> uh, it's now clipped. But again, this, this color uh, uh, um, uh, balance layer, it's been clipped. But then the second part, and this is incredibly important, you need to change its blending mode from normal down to color. So it does color change only. One of the things I forgot to tell you about the curve that's right underneath it, this curve has still got a normal blending mode. You need to change that blending mode to luminosity because that's all we wanted to change was the luminosity, not the color. So back to my color balance layer now. Again, it's clipped and it's got its blending mode changed to color. And now ask yourself, what color do I need to make this a figure, this outfit? Well, she's blue right now. I need her to be warmed up. Look at your color balance up at the very top. These have got complementary colors. She's too blue, so immediately I'm going to grab my yellow slider and I'm, my yellow blue axis slider and I'm going to click on that and I'm gonna start pushing this towards the uh, left to actually warm up her outfit. I'm gonna stop at this point because I'm also seeing a lot of green in here. So then I'm going to go to my magenta green slider and I'm going to start pushing this slightly towards the magenta. That would be too strong. You'll see this will actually, she becomes totally magenta. That's way too much of a correction. So I'm going to back this off till it matches my other scene here a little bit better. So I'm going to continue, actually not do that with a track, with my tablet, but we'll do it with a trackpad. So this is now getting closer to, the, to, to, to what I think should actually match the background. So again, if you turn this color on and off, you can actually see that it's actually brought her more into the color palette of my scene. So then when I come up, you can turn off your color, your hue saturation and your color check layer and come back down to your color layer right now, the adjustment color balance layer and turn it on and off. And you can see that that warmth brought this whole thing back together. And then finally, saturation check layer is the last one to click on. So with the saturation check layer, what happens is, is that anything in your image that is um, strongly saturated will be white. Anything that is really weakly saturated or no saturation at all will be really dark. That's why her outfit is almost black. It's because it has no color. It's completely desaturated. Her face, though, is actually a completely different story. Her face, in my opinion, is not really matching the background. So to fix this, you need to put on a hue saturation curve. So the last thing that we'll do here Click on the add adjust. Again, I've got my color adjustment layer. The color balance layer is the one that's still picked right now. I'm going to click on this to add a hue saturation layer on top of this. Again, two moves. Your first move is to actually hover between the two, hold down your option key, and clip this down. Clip this to go down and then you need to change the blending mode of your hue saturation layer from normal to saturation so that we are only impacting that. And then what I feel like I need is her face to be slightly lighter to match this sort of the rest of the image, the background stuff in here. So I'm gonna grab the saturation slider. If you go in one direction, if you go to the left, it actually starts to get darker. We actually need to go slightly to the right to lift it up a little bit. So we're actually increasing the saturation slightly of this. Again, you can turn the eyeball on and off to see the difference that we're making. It's very subtle. I'm actually going to pop it a little bit harder and turn this on and off. And then finally, I'm going to go up and turn off my saturation check layer. Does this girl fit this scene now? Damn right. Game changer. Every time I say that, though, isn't that on some commercial? Game changer. Anyway, questions about this?
This will change everything for you guys. I did the so I started with luminosity, and that was the hue saturation. Uh, I'm mean, sorry, the uh, shadows highlights smart filter. Then I actually added a curve to open up that darker part of the middle of her jacket. Is that what you're asking about? So the color balance part again. So I clicked on this guy. I'll go ahead and turn on the um, the two color check ones. So this color balance right here, if you want to see what I did, so it's a minus 17 blue and a minus 5 magenta. I don't think that's what you're asking. To turn the blue of the figure into something warm so that it matches the background. So take a look at this. Can you tell where the figure ends and the background begins? No, you're trying to get them to be the same. That's the goal. But again, because you've got it clipped to the figure alone, it's only changing the figure, which is what we want to do. Questions about any of this? Uh, okay, so we don't have time to build a new background. Are there any other questions about this part? Again, these things are so incredibly powerful for you to actually use. So let me just show you really quickly because I don't want to leave you hanging and we'll look at the assignments because we've got to change that part. If you actually take a look <coughs> in your system, in your session number nine, there's a thing that's called check layers PDF. If you open that up, this is how you build them. So if you want to build your own, you're welcome to do that but you've now got them and they run as an action as long as you never throw those actions away. This thing will run for you forevermore. So that's basically, but this is how you build them if you wanna know how to build them. Um, and then we haven't got into extreme color matching. We'll look at that again next week. Um, in the build background exercise, we are not gonna have a chance to get to that today. So with that being said, <clears throat> Your assignment is to, if we take a look at your assignment right here, so <clears throat> there's two of them, there's a 9-1 and a 9-2 here, is the first one is to, um, uh, um, you can either go out and shoot a real background or you can take an image that, already, that you've already shot that is a background or you can go find a background online. You can harvest an image, I don't care how you get the background, but it needs to be real. And then you need to take one of these two figures. You'll see that there is a composite body one and a composite body two. You need to put one of those figures into your background and match it. So what I'm going to be looking for is all the things that we just did here. I'm going to be looking for scale. I'm going to be looking for perspective. I'm going to be looking for exposure, color, all of that. Does that make sense? then the build background one we will do that next week and so you don't need to do assignment number 9.2 because that's actually using an artificial background that you build and we haven't gotten a chance to get to that yes oh yeah well the week the next week we're together no i expect you all to be here on spring break <laughs> me too even though i'm not even going to be in chicago kentucky uh -huh. What's left of it? So, Prof, I still don't understand. What does it mean to create that run, that run that is... We haven't done that yet. That's what I just said. So we will do that next week. So you don't need to do assignment 9-2, which is the create background one. And, like, I felt like uh, in, in which week you taught us to create shadows. Yeah. So like we all need to go back to check the videos. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, well, actually, here, we can do this because we've got five minutes left, so we'll just do shadows really quickly here. It'll just be easier. easier. Okay, so I'm going to go back into my image. Again, in five minutes, we can do this whole thing. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to turn off my color check layers. 
Okay, so I'm gonna come back down. To do your shadows, you need to do them underneath the figure, but on top of your background, because that's how shadows would actually fall. So I'm gonna select my background layer. I'm going to then add a blank layer on top of that and rename it Shadows 1 and say okay to that. Then I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna do this using my trackpad. I'm gonna hit the G key to get the gradient tool when you use the gradient tool, I'm also going to hit the D key to default my foreground and background colors to black and white. Black is my foreground color. If white is your foreground color, hit the X key and make it, you need black as your foreground color. Up at the, <coughs> with the G key selected, uh, up at the very, at the options part, you'll have a drop down menu. You can do either gradient or classic gradient. Go ahead for right now, pick classic gradient. Then in the drop-down type of gradient, the icon that's right to the right of that, click on this drop-down, open up the basic gradient panel, and you're going to click the one in the middle, which is foreground to transparency. And then finally, in the types of gradient at the very top, there's five little icons that run across the top. You want to do the second one from the left, which is a radial gradient. And then when you come down to your image right now, working on your shadow number one layer, simply click and drag down and it will do a radial gradient that goes from black to transparent. So this is how you would start to do all of your shadows. Your very next move is Command T to actually transform that gradient. <clears throat> I need to collapse it. I need to reshape the gradient so that it's going to be a shadow that goes underneath her foot. So I'm going to grab the low point, the control handle that's at the very bottom. We'll call it 6 o'clock. If you click and drag up, it only moves the uh, uh, bottom part up. It compresses the shadow from the bottom up. I don't want to do that. I want to compress it equally from the top and the bottom. So you hold down the Option key to do that, and then they'll, both handles will move. So I'm crushing this down to make it relatively flat. I'm also still gonna hold down my option key and click on the handle that would be at three o'clock to make it a little bit more narrow. And then I need to move the shadow. You, when you move the shadow, you just hover your cursor in the middle. You can click and move it. You need to stay away from the anchor point because if you get too close to the anchor point, it'll grab the anchor point and move that. So I'm simply going to bring this down underneath her foot. That's the actually the one that's on the left-hand side. Bring your cursor outside of the bounding box and you can actually rotate this so that the shadow actually matches the angle of her shoe. And then again, I'm gonna leave it as a big shadow like this just so that you can see the last step. But I'm gonna go ahead and say okay to this, check mark to say okay to that. Then hit the E key to get the eraser tool. With the eraser tool picked, you want to make sure that your eraser hardness is about 50%, that it is a brush, 100% opacity, 6% flow. You want a very small flow on this because I want to be able to scrub on this shadow to get rid of parts of it. So you can see that there would be no shadow in the very front of this shoe. So I'm working on this with that eraser tool and I'm just going to start scrubbing back and forth to actually make this uh, a little bit sharper edge. There was, uh, there's also shadow back behind her that would never be there. I'm going to erase that using the same scrubbing tool here. And this is the way I begin to actually do this part. So then I'm going to add another layer on top of my shadow number one, and I'm gonna call it shadow two, and say okay. Hit the G key to get the gradient tool. Click and drag out a gradient. Hit Command T to get the transform dialog box. Hold down the Option key and compress this. Also make it skinnier and a little bit tighter. Click outside and drag this underneath her other shoe right here. You can use your up and down arrow keys to actually slightly move it up or down. I'm gonna go ahead and check OK for that. Hit the E key to get your eraser tool. Make it a little bit smaller and get rid of the shadow that's on both sides. There would never be a shadow on both sides. So this will begin to actually build your shadow for the shoes, and they're actually looking pretty good. I'm going to do one last shadow, <clears throat> add one more blank layer, name it Shadow 3. Hit the G key to get the gradient tool, click and drag it out. Command T to transform, hold down the Option key, click to compress this. In this case, I'm going to leave it really wide because I want to do a shadow for her whole body. 
I'm going to rotate that slightly to line up with her shoes. I'm going to say OK to this. Hit the E key to get your eraser. Get rid of that shadow on both sides, the shadow that's on the other side over here. But then this shadow would not be anywhere near as dark as the shadows that are underneath her. So grab the opacity of this top layer and drop it way down. And you'll be surprised how much you can bring this down. I'm going to bring mine down around 20-30%. It doesn't look like there's anything there until you actually turn this on and off. And now you've got your figure grounded. You can continue to rework on these more. I think that the shadows underneath her shoes are probably a little too strong as well. So I'm going to go back to my shadow number one and drop its opacity back a little bit. Not too much, but back a little bit. Yeah, and that feels better to me. And that's it. That's simple shadows. Well, that's just, um, here my last question. So, uh, yeah, you, 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 you can see that round of this one. How about the other one? Like, how, how can we judge where's the, uh, where's the horizon line? So I will show you next week how to establish horizon lines on uh, here, I can show you this really quick. If you want to stay, go, stay. If you don't go, it'll be on the video. I'll show you how to establish a horizon line really quickly. <coughs> it works just like we did with the subway station. Remember the subway station? We set up the horizon line. Same thing. So if we go to your perspective image, there's inside of your perspective image there is a file called joseph odenstock open it so again i'm going to turn the shadow off and the body off all the other stuff i'm going to turn off so I've just got, this is my background. This is the only thing that I've actually got in here. But I'm going to hit the F key to go to my pasteboard. I'm going to hit the P key to get the pen tool. I'm going to zoom in to this ledge that's sitting right here. Yeah, my question is like, I mean the bro. Like how, how do I know the bro I mean this original like, uh, horizon? Yeah. Uh, again, there's no way, because she's in the studio right now, there's no definitive way that we've got to actually put that in. But that's why I had the girl that was already in the woods, and I could establish her based on the girl that was in the woods. So again, she was scaled the right size, so she was in the right position to actually be in that perspective. So instead of actually doing guidelines here to find my vanishing point, I didn't need to. I already had a figure that was in its place. And I just replaced so the figure. So since like we're now uh, next <laughs> this week's assignment, we're doing the other way around. We got a girl, and we have two crazy. So you're absolutely right, but you have two girls. Just create a flat surface. Just just find a. Um, <laughs> sorry. It's so okay. Yeah, just just find a uh, just just stand like. A, yeah, if you're shooting a background, if you're shooting a background, just do it from your regular camera position. What will really be, how, however, how do you shoot? So the girl that, uh, the two figures that you have, both of those figures, I can tell you right now, they are shot roughly from a sitting position. So about this level. They're not down on the ground, they're not down like this. They're not on an apple box up like this. They're roughly about here. That's roughly about where it is. It is my only question. Okay. Any other? Shoot. Hold that thought. Let me just pause the video because I don't think you need this on the video. Okay, yeah, that's uh, yeah, this is usually the case.